details. I'll say again, my name is Joe Filipek, uh, Consulting Continuing Education Manager. We have a lot of people uh, viewing this online, hence the microphone. I know you guys can hear me without, without it, but for the folks that are viewing online. Uh, just a few reminders, again, before we get started, January 2nd, 22nd, we have a uh, webinar on preventing harassment, building respect in the workplace being done by Management Association. Also on February, 9, uh, February 5th, two-part workshop being done by Aaron Schmidt. Some of you may have um, been a part of the webinars that Aaron did for us on web design and user experience. A really great presenter, so he's doing a two-part workshop for us on graphic design, specifically for uh, libraries, librarians. So there are, that's filling up fast, but there are still spots remaining, so if you're interested, go into L2, register for that one. Um, on to today's workshop, uh, you know, I think whether you're a new supervisor, I've been doing it for 50 years, there's always something new to learn, something to rethink about, a new concept to be introduced to, um, it's always relevant, we always need to be talking about it to be better. And to that end, we're very happy to have Pat Wagner with us today. Um, I'll let Pat introduce herself in a minute, but I know some of you, uh, Pat has been doing this for a while, has trained a lot in Illinois, um, and I imagine some of you maybe have seen her workshops before, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, we do have a second workshop today at uh, 1.30 on library change, so if you are here, if you're online, we hope that you can stick around for that one as well. And for those that are watching online, I just remind you to uh, use a chat box if, uh, if you want to convey a question or comment, and we'll try to get through those as best we can. Uh, so with that, I think I will turn it over to you, Pat. Okay, this sounds on. This is good. And I'll just grab the clicker here. Um, I want to thank folks for joining us today. My name is Pat Wagner. And I want to first tell you a little bit about the program we're going to do this morning and um, give you kind of a little overview. For those of you who don't have your handouts out, if you could make sure we have two handouts here at the program in Burr Ridge. And those of you hopefully were able to download your handouts from the emails that were sent out as well. Uh, we're going to do this in two parts. The first part is we're going to work from the slides and kind of get a, a bigger overview of what's going on. Uh, in a couple of minutes, we are going to review the print handout so that you have that in mind about things we're going to do. Uh, we're going to take a look at some of the key ideas that we're covering today. And I know, for example, that um, as Joe alluded to, there's some people here who may be new to supervision, some literally doing it for decades. So we brought a lot of material more than we can do in a three-hour program. So part of the decision of what we're going to cover is based on questions that people have. So we're going to have a little feedback session as well. We're going to have some exercises. Um, we're not going to do anything goofy. There aren't going to be any role plays. You're not going to be asked to share, anything like that. But what we do like to do is give you a chance to talk to your colleagues, to sit and write and think. And we encourage you to help us with questions and so on. And then we have some resources. I always like to share my favorite books and authors. Uh, and I tend to look for the evergreens, folks who've been in print doing this kind of thing literally for decades that have proven to be really solid as well. We're going to have breaks um, uh, in one hour and two hours. We're not doing brain surgery, so if you need to take a break, we certainly understand. And when we are doing a formal break, we'll have the break slide up as well. So there, I wanted to give you an idea of what we're going to be thinking about over the next three hours, and then we'll get a little feedback and I'll introduce myself as well. First of all, the main thing always is improving productivity and workplace relationships, and it's both things. You know, some people kind of err on the side, it's all about productivity, and they sort of forget that people are people, that we're dealing with human beings. On the other side, they're the people who are so attached to the emotional relationships they forget about the productivity issues. And that can be hard, uh, particularly if you're working in a smaller library or a smaller community where people have known each other for decades, uh, relatives, friends, neighbors, people from other workplaces. I had a situation a few years ago with a woman in a rural library and she was having a real problem because one of the people who worked for her was 83 years old and would come in and basically fall asleep all day. 
I was on the payroll. And we said, you know, you really have to, I'm, and I used the F word, fire her. And the woman said, here's the problem, Pat. This lady was my Sunday school teacher when I was growing up, and I'm really afraid if I fire her, I'm going to hell. So we had to have that <laughs> theological discussion about what it meant to be a supervisor and deal with things. Growing skills and commitment. <clears throat> Some people say, how do you know if someone's a good supervisor? I said, one of the best ways to tell is if you stick somebody with someone who's a great supervisor, you will watch the skill set of that person improve. And again, not just their technical and professional skill set, but there's like a maturity that happens. Um, I tell people that one of the, maybe the best compliment that you'll ever get as a supervisor is when somebody leaves and as they're going out the door, they come into your office and say, I'm a better person for having worked for you. That's like the ultimate goal. And there's very few places that we can increase capacity in these changing times without spending a lot of money. And one of the things we look for great supervisors for is to be able to increase the capacity for people to get along and do the work they need to do. So that is very much a benchmark of great supervision. And then the whole thing about what is positive reinforcement and what are contracts. Um, to be honest with you, I think a lot of people kind of flail around when it comes to supervision. Uh, and again, on one hand, <coughs> they really don't have written expectations so that everybody's on the same page. And I'm not talking necessarily about the job description. Some people work without job descriptions. That's not a big deal to me. But it's sort of like, what's the expectation? Because I know this shocks you, but I've watched people build up resentment, not for years, but for decades, because someone wasn't doing their job well. And then someone like myself comes in to work with the staff and found out everybody assumed the other person knew what they were supposed to be doing and what the expectation was about this. So this is very important. And the other thing which we'll be talking about is positive reinforcement. Um, I'll be suggesting a book, um, and I'll mention the title several times. It's called Don't Shoot the Dog by Karen Pryor. And to me, it's one of the gold standards for understanding positive reinforcement and how to use it. This is not touchy-feely, folks. This is the basis of behavioral science about how people are treated. Now, I grew up in an immigrant family on the south side of Chicago. And my parents were old country in some ways, which means you never praise children to their face. That was like 15 years of therapy, I'll tell you, that was the result. So a lot of us use um, the same skills that we used in our, and learned in our families. And I've had people say to me, I don't know why I have to be pleasant to my employees, I pay them on time. I don't know why I have to say please and thank you to my employees, it's just the job they're doing. But there's been enough tests that have convinced me that the absolute best way to work with people is positive reinforcement. But it doesn't have to be that phony kind of um, affirmation thing that, that makes me kind of uh, uh, gag. No, we're not going to do that. But these are sort of the three outcomes for today that, that you feel more comfortable with all these things as well. Let's see here. There we go. So we're going to do a little feedback first and foremost, and I'd like you to think for about a minute or two about what brought you here today. What about the topic brought you here today? And we'll be collecting feedback both from people here at Burr Ridge and also all of our folks out there. Um, and think about what would be useful. And we'll take a few minutes for that. And part of the reason, too, is sometimes have people have something very specific on their mind, and it's something I can answer in a minute. Or it's something off topic that I might be able to say something about, but I'll say, no, we're not going to be dealing with this this day. So what about supervision? What's something that you're interested in, curious about, hypothetically even, right? And you can always change names and lie. We won't know. And so let's come back in about a minute and we'll see what um, we have. So I'm going to put the little break slide up again. Here we go. And we'll come back in about a minute and we'll poll the audiences and see what we have. I'll start with the folks here in Burr Ridge. If you have something on your mind today that you'd like to be, make it part of the curriculum for the morning, uh, just raise your hand, let me call on you, and we'll see what we have. Yes, please. Tying supervision to the strategic plan. 
OK, say again louder, please. Tying supervision to the strategic plan. Tying supervision to the strategic plan. And we're going to talk about this. And this is important because it's all about shared goals. Um, a good strategic plan helps us make hard decisions. I feel terrific because I'm here in Illinois. My office back in Colorado is running smoothly. And I have an employee who's working on a number of big projects for me. And Toby checks in two or three times a day. And he knows his priorities because he knows our strategic plan. You know, with me not there, he knows how to organize his day. He knows what needs to be done for the two weeks that I'm not going to be in the office about things. And so he can make choices. And that idea that he can align with choices is very important. So we will be talking about this today. Great. Anything else that might have piqued your interest about the topic today? Communication. Communication. Could you be more specific, please? Well, Okay. And it's like something always, it's always the person who did not receive that piece of information out of a staff of 20, the person who did not get the information will be the one who will have a contact with the patron about whatever that particular issue was. Right. I will not know the answer, I will give the patron wrong information. Okay, so there are two things you said which I think are important. One is the issue of communication. We're having to give people a lot of information, and you've got frontline staff who are dealing directly with library users, and it always seems that there's certain people who miss information and they connect. Um, so, so that's the first issue. But the second issue is there a pattern of certain people who over and over again seem to miss the information, or is it throughout the library? Is it pretty generalized? Okay, we don't have much time, so. Okay. It's a person you would never expect to have contact with the patron. They're not frontline staff. Mm -hmm. They don't work at the, at the circulation desk or at the reference desk. Mm -hmm. They're just passing through on their way. To oh, okay, so and it's people. The ones who will get right. Okay, let me just say, this is an interesting problem. The problem is you've got all sorts of changes happening in the workplace, and correct me if I'm wrong. And so even though you don't think that that particular person who might be tech services or something will be interacting directly with a library user, they are, they are, and they don't, for whatever reason, have the information to give the correct answer. Is that? Yes. Okay, very good. So what we're talking about is what to do when we don't know. Which is pretty, it's a pretty simple thing. What to do when we don't know. And let me just tell a, a quick story about this. Um, the Farmington Public Library, Farmington, New Mexico, one of my favorite public libraries in the United States, they actually, uh, it, it's kind of a gritty city, and they have a big parking lot, which becomes a focus for drug dealers and unseemly things. So they have big, burly, armed guards, a lot of them ex-military and police there as a presence. The director, Karen McFeeders, has sent all of the guards to introduction to reference. Basically, they all have support staff level introduction to reference. So they all know where the old Chilton guides were, and they know where the collection is and everything. And the last time I was there, it was kind of funny because the guides came up and said, we asked for a special session with you, Pat, because our problem is we're in the middle of doing a reference interview. And then we look out the window and say, oh, excuse me, we have to chase down that drug dealer in the parking lot. And we want a polite way to interrupt the reference interview because our real job is being um, a police officer. And we talked about this. So there's a key. There's a key which I'm going to give you a word to think about as we're going through, which has to do with anticipation. And what that means is we know there's going to be a problem. So let's sit down and think strategically about this is a problem we all share, and the big issue is what do we do when we don't know what to do and what to say? Um, and uh, there's a... There's a um, mythology in libraries that everybody's supposed to know everything, 
and that we're all smart and everything. And for some people, it's really painful to look at someone and say, I can find that out for you or I know who has the answer, rather than making something up or struggling or something like that. So we'll talk more about that. You had your hand up. Um, yes, how do you measure productivity? Oh, very good. How do you measure productivity? <clears throat> and we'll talk a little bit about that. And I think, um, I'll, I'll tell you my general philosophy about this is, libraries are understaffed. And very few of the people I work with in libraries have learned kind of the um, issues of productivity and what it's about. So the short answer is you check out the statistics for other libraries and you take it a department at a time, starting with the ones where it's easier to measure, like, for example, in cataloging, you know? Like, I will say to someone, okay, you're a library this size, has this circulation, you're in this size town, you have this many staff people. What's the norm among libraries your size and shape for how much copy cataloging you can, you can get done in a week? And don't do the weird kind of hour thing where you stand over people with a stopwatch, you don't have the time and energy to do that. And that will give you a general idea of a benchmark of where you are for better or worse. It's information. And then it'll be interesting if you start talking to your colleagues and other libraries and they say, oh wow, we get twice that much out. Oh, that's interesting. What are you doing differently from us? And I'll tell you what one library director in Nebraska did, which I thought was brilliant. She was at a level where she didn't know if they were being as productive as they could, so she invited over some library directors from her area who knew her library, knew the area, knew what they were doing, and asked them to come in as an advisory panel for a day, and what they did is they hung out for a day. Now, any one of you could do this with your own libraries. You know, it's kind of like, have you ever walked into a friend's house after they've redecorated and thought, what were they thinking when they painted the walls this color? You know, and you're thinking, oh, we could have done so much better. Well, everybody can look over everybody else's shoulder, and it's a cheap, effective way to do it, and you have to have enough of a healthy eagle to be able to say, we're gonna have our friends come in and they're gonna give us advice. We don't know if it's all good advice or not, but isn't it wonderful that we have such a collaborative profession that people can help each other? And people look over each other's shoulder and said, oh, we stopped doing that two years ago. We found this is a better way because it's this and this. And when people visit, it might be the directors, it might be the managers or something. And the woman in question in Nebraska who told me about this said, you know, we have an award-winning library. I've been president of the Nebraska Library Association. I've been director of the year. I've been doing this 30 years. But that one day, having my colleagues come in, feeling comfortable giving me and my staff feedback, changed our library and brought it to a, a much higher level about things. Um, the other thing, and I want to give you everybody, this is a resource if you don't know. There's a group in Colorado called Library Research Services, LRS.org. And they are a nonprofit organization started by our state library in Colorado many years ago. They are the one of the premier organizations in the country for helping libraries do research and statistical research and surveys and everything like that. They have tons of free services. Um, we're going to be holding a conference in the spring in Colorado having to do with research techniques for libraries. And I, I think it's already filled up. It was just like everyone wanted to attend. But I really strongly suggest that as a starting point to learn how to do the really specific research inside that lrs.org is a great place to go to for that reason as well. Um, it sounds like you're speaking of uh, departments that might be able to be measured. Right. By mm -hmm. That's why I said start with the ones that you can and work from there. What's, what's one, and we'll do this real quick because this is off topic, but tell me one that you want to measure and you don't know how. Um, a staff person who says they work a full time and uh, in youth services and how many uh, programs can they handle, how, how much of their time is being utilized um, appropriately um, rather than 
of, of how much work to expect from people. Okay, well, I think this is, the, this is good. Let's, let's leave this to the end. And I'm going to ask you, the, the question is, how can you tell in areas that may not be just how many books you're cataloging, um, how to tell if someone's being as productive as they might be? And I'd like to wait to the end only because we may answer the question by the end, and then we'll return to it and have a little time. It's also complicated enough for what we have to do today. Um, at the end of today, you'll have all my contact information. I don't charge for phone or email consultation, and that includes the people who are at a distance, too. So if we aren't able to answer your questions satisfactorily, contact me, okay? We can have a chat about that. So is there anyone? Um, yeah, we have some uh, comments online. We, several people mentioned wanting to improve leadership skills. Um, we have someone, director retiring and maybe moving into that position. Um, how to effectively supervise volunteers. Okay, let me just start. Oh, sorry, you have to give them to me one at a time. Sorry. So the first thing is leadership. Mm -hmm. This isn't a class on leadership. So that's easy. <laughs> okay, um, this is a class on supervision. and. We are going to review this, though, because leadership and supervision, they overlap in terms of influence, but they're two separate sets of skills. Supervision is about the person in front of you. Leadership is about the shining mansion on the hill. And I'll tell you now, I don't know if this is true, Joe, but some people use leadership as a code word for, I can't get people to do what I'm asking them to do. And first of all, I'm saying, are you actually asking them to do the job they were hired for? And then the second thing is, and what happens if they don't? You know, um, I hope everyone loves office supplies as much as I do. I actually save this orange pan for this particular word. And one of the things we're going to talk about are the danger of what's called warm chats. Warm chats are conversations where nothing happens. How many people here um, have ever gotten sucked into warm chats, endless conversation? And that's because you are forgetting one of the basic ideas of behavioral science, and we're going to be talking about that this morning. Without a consequence, there's no behavior change. And a consequence can be something positive, or a consequence can be something negative. But, and, and yes, I've worked with union workplaces, and I've worked with tenured faculty in state universities, and I've worked with everything from, you know, big, huge libraries like the undergraduate library at Harvard to small rural libraries throughout the Midwest. I've worked with everybody, and at the end of the day, if the supervisor doesn't have what we call the will to govern, who says, your behavior is telling me you don't want this job. And that makes me sad because we think you're a good employee. But you're not acting as if you want this job. So you decide. And, and one of the books that we're, we're mentioning, which is called, it's in, your, it's in your reference section, by a man named Dick Grote called Discipline Without Punishment. I hate the name. Um, really sort of goes back to say, do you know what the expectations are and if you're not doing the work you're hired for, I don't have a job, I don't have the money to pay you for doing something else. Um, I would say that most of the time when the issue comes up of people not doing what they're paid to do, there's two things. First of all, expectations, they actually don't know what the job is. And the second thing is like they know nothing's going to happen. So, you know, nagging doesn't work in our species. It really does not work. And so if you find yourself in a struggle with people and nagging them, it's not about the person. You have taught them that nothing's going to happen. So why shouldn't they just have a job where they can do anything they want? Okay, you are teaching them that that's okay. That's okay. And it doesn't have to be nice versus mean. You can be nice and rational. You can be civil and productive. And yes, I've had to fire people. I had to fire two people last year. And I've had the conversation about, this is the job I have for you, and this is what I'm paying you to do. If you're choosing not to do this work, then you're telling me you don't want the job. And more than once I've said to someone, I'm going to give you the rest of the day off. And I, I have that prerogative since I'm a private sector person. 
you have the rest of the day off, come back tomorrow and tell me if you want this job. And you know what? Some people never come back and some people say, I really want this job. And I said, then here's the requirement as a reminder, let's go through what it is your job's about. And if you choose, if there's what we call slippage, I can't have this conversation with you once a week. That's a waste of time. So if you start slipping back to your old ways, that's the signal that you've determined not to work here anymore, and I'm sorry, good luck. And you know, the sad thing is there are some people, even if you give them a direct, I don't want to say order, but a direct, this is what your job is, still will think that you're goofing on them, particularly if there's been a history. Um, there was a, a friend of ours, and I won't mention the library, uh, it, but I will say that in this particular state, this woman, this poor library had the worst director I have ever worked with in 35 years. And fortunately, she was finally retired out. Terrific new director came in. First day, this was a few years ago, she noticed that her CERC clerk was paying, playing computer games at the CERC desk at the computer because there was, quote, no work to be done because there wasn't anyone at the CERC desk. And the director said, oh, hey, let me explain. First of all, we don't play computer games. Um, unless you're showing a patron something. And the second thing is that if there's no one at the CERC desk, you go to tech services, you go to reference, here's all the things you do. We'll get you a list so you know what the expectations are. And if I come back and ever catch you doing computer games again, you're fired on the spot. Are there any questions? The woman said no. The next day, <laughs> the next day the director comes to work walks by the CERC desk and there's the same woman playing computer games. So she said, you're gone, grabbed her keys, said, you're out. Um, she escorted out and the woman started crying and said, but I love my job here. I love it and, and I would go out and I would sweep the sidewalk with a broom if you asked me. And the woman said, yes, I'm sure you love your job because you've never done your job as long as you're here and that's not what we're hiring for. We're hiring you for this, this, and this. You've just decided not to work here anymore. And the woman was shocked. So don't be surprised if you're ever in this situation and basically say, if you paint the front door red, you're fired, and you come in the next day and there they are, painting the front door red. Uh, I don't know what's on people's minds at those points, but it's amazing. Let's take one more, Joe. Do you have another one? Yeah. Um a few comments from people who, who supervise volunteers mm -hmm. or student workers who aren't necessarily, I mean, in the case of volunteers paid, or student workers and other staff that are not necessarily going to pursue a career in librarianship. Sure. Um, that, that came up a few times. Right. Well, the thing is, it's a job, folks. Now, two things real quick, and then we're going to um, go through the slides and then... Um, uh, and we'll go through the handout and then go through the slides. Uh, the first thing is, and we've run into this in several places around the country, you have to treat volunteers like employees. You have to evaluate them, you have to screen them. If you're in a state, and, and everybody's different now, but I visit states like Indiana, which require background checks for anyone who works in a library. You know, anyone who's going to deal with children has to have a background check. So. The volunteer community, the nonprofit community, literally figured out in the 1960s that volunteers had to be treated legally and ethically just like any other employee. You don't get a pass because you're not paying them. They get to be hired and fired and evaluated and trained and screened just like everybody else. And if you can't do that, you shouldn't happen because uh, at the very worst, it's a lawsuit waiting to happen, you know? Um, and it doesn't matter if they don't want to be a librarian, you know, or don't want to go to library school. So the nonprofit community is literally about 50 years ahead of the, of the library community in terms of the treatment of volunteers. So, so go to your, your collection on volunteer management from the nonprofit community and you'll get a lot of great information about that. With student workers and everybody else, the number one sin is not adequate training and super supervision, and I hear this from public and academic libraries, from the students, from the students. And I was just at a large university in California two weeks ago and uh, doing strategic planning work, but some of the student workers found out I was there and came and almost came to me in a group and said, we aren't told how to do our jobs. We have not a single piece of paper outlining what our work is, 
But what we do is get a five minute speed thing and then, oh, well, we don't have enough time to teach you your job, and then we get yelled at. So are they surprised that we're apathetic and cynical about our time at the library? There's always an investment in time. There's always an investment in time, and if you don't do that, there's a consequence as well. So everything I'm talking about today applies to anybody. It applies to janitors, applies to part-timers, it applies to student workers, it applies definitely to volunteers as well. So if folks, if you could take a look really quick at your handout, the one that starts with mastering the organizational map. I want to show you what it is before we get started on the slides, because what we're going to do is the slides are going to be more about the big issue things, and then we're going to dig in with the handout and actually do some exercises. And the organizational map, this is going to answer the question about what's the difference between leadership and supervision. We're going to be talking about, um, definitely we're going to be talking about the issue of positive influence, which is on page three of the handout. We will be talking about motivation and number five, the conflict triangle, which is very much about how to have good contracts with people about the work that needs to be done. We have information about um, resolving conflicts on page seven. We might not go into that unless an issue comes up. And then if you please turn to page 11, we're going to be talking about, and this is definitely on page 11, where we learn how strategic planning ties in to supervision in the model that we have in page 11, which is from the project management world. And then if you look at page, um, starting on page 15, basically it's about kind of looking at yourself in your library and giving yourself a score about what are the qualities of someone who's a good supervisor and you're going to score yourself on how well you think you do those things. And then if you look at the very end on page 18, this is kind of our gold standard of books that we think are terrific that we hope some of them you may already have in your libraries, professional development libraries, and we'll be referring to them as the day goes as well. So the feedback was very useful. Thank you. It kind of gives me an idea of what's on some people's minds about things. So who am I? Um, my name's Pat. You can tell from my accent. I was born and raised here in Chicagoland, grew up on the south side. I've been working as a consultant and trainer for libraries since 1978, but I'm not a librarian. I do all the other stuff. Um, the joke is I teach people the stuff that maybe you didn't learn in library school, if you have an MLS. I've uh, been coming out through Illinois libraries now for over 20 years. Uh, in the olden days before electricity, when we had all the library systems, I worked with most of them. So I might have seen you at a system meeting in this part of the country or at your state library conference or something for your state library and so on. I also am a frequent speaker at ALA and MLA and AA, LL. So a lot of chances that we've had a chance to talk. And yes, I feel for theological full disclosure, yes, even though I'm a Southsider, I am still a Cubs fan. Um, for those of you, thank you, thank you. Uh, for those of you, next year, right? Yes. <laughs> next year. <laughs> you know, the, the Broncos really heartbreaking loss on Sunday didn't affect me very much because, hey, the Cubs didn't win the World Series, so who cares? And then um, I always like to say where we get our images from for our, our, for our handouts and for our slides. And those come from pixabay.com, which is a great site where you can get free um, art from photo photographers and artists from all over the world, and they don't require even an attribution. Isn't that nice? So even putting their name up like this is more than they expect, and they've got some great stuff. So anyway, we're going to go through. So we're going to talk about why supervision is key to success, and I want to let you know that I feel strongly enough about it that if a client comes to me and says, what's the one thing that you could come in and work with our staff about that would have the most impact on our library, and I'd say, give me your supervisors. Increasing the ability of supervisors to supervise well is, I know, the absolute best way to improve productivity, capacity, however, influence in a library more than anything else. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the writing, the, the contracts and agreements, and give you some simple guidelines, you know, just to kind of get you started. We are going to talk about positive reinforcement 
and a very simple three-part model that works incredibly well. I mean, incredibly well. And it ain't touchy-feely. And yes, it works on old coots. How many people have old coots working for them? Anybody here? Yeah, I see some hands. Um, the dangers of conflict avoidance about things. And when we talk about the model about strategic goals and supervision, we'll be talking about the difference between micromanagement and oversight. Because some people don't realize they're micromanaging when they could be doing oversight. So this is the key idea. And the key idea of any program is what I want you to remember above anything else. And the key idea is your success is measured by the success of the people you supervise. And we're going to bring this up again because this is an incredibly hard thing for competent people to understand. That it's not about you being competent in stepping in and saving the day. It's about me being a competent supervisor because I'm 900 miles away from my office and Toby's doing a great job without me and doesn't really need me there to do a terrific job and his skills are improving. That's how we measure success. And it's very painful if you are a very competent person and maybe the people who are currently working for you aren't as competent as you are. And that's where we say that your job is to make them competent. It's not your job to rescue them. It's not your job to fix the little things immediately because that becomes a real dangerous trap. Uh, that's why, to be honest, I know a lot of really smart people who are really, can I say lousy? Lousy supervisors because they step in and save the day over and over and over again and teach their people they don't have to do a good job because their great supervisor is going to do a better job for them. And the person with the terrific pe people skills and supervisory skills are the ones who, I, ha I had one director I, who was sort of like mock complaining with me, a, a California director. She said, you know, she said, I can't keep employees. And I said, why is that? She said, they get hired away. And I, she said, um, every time I bring up a good person, they're snatched away. And we were laughing about it. She said, I realize that's part of the problem of being a great supervisor is that people see that you're producing all these terrific people, right, who can then go on to bigger and better careers other places, particularly if you're a small library. But on the other hand, her library has a great reputation as a place to learn how to be a good supervisor. So they always have great people who want to work for her. But there's a certain percentage after three to five years, they're out to their next best thing. So this is sort of what happens. So first thing we're going to do is a little exercise here where I'd like you to um, get a piece of paper, or you can use your slide handout um, to be able to do this. This is on, on this sheet, it's slide number nine. It might be slightly different on your slide handout. And we're going to give you five ideas. The f and I'd like to give you, have you give yourself a score from one to 10 about how well you think you know how to do these things. If you're really brave, you can take this back to your library and ask people who work with you or for you to evaluate you as well. Most people, by the way, evaluate themselves too low. About 10%, 15% will give yourselves too high a score, but most of you will give yourselves too low a score. It just This is sort of how it works. And, and then let's see what we have. And then at the end of the program, we'll take a look at this list again and see if anyone feels like, yeah, I think I, I, I can improve. Because what we're trying to do is to set a benchmark and then decide how we can improve our scores, basically. So the five things that we want people to do is, first of all, how well are you at what we call practicing the benefit of supervision? Meaning that how much do you model the great behavior of a great supervisor? Great supervisors are great listeners. They're great at communicating the specifics of what they need. Um, they're very good at talking about what supervision is and so on. They're very good at thinking out loud with their people. So there's this education that's going on all the time. So how good are you, do you think, at basically modeling, being that person that people say, yeah, that's what a great supervisor does. Number two is knowing the details of your workplace contracts and following them in word and deed. You know, I know this is shocking, but I visit libraries where the supervisors have never read the union contract, have never looked through the job descriptions, have never had a conversation with HR. 
We had a situation with a large state library. Uh, this would have been a state university library. And when I say large, 900 employees, that's kind of a big library spread over a dozen different buildings on you know, three or four different sites. And I was brought in to talk about how do you supervise students? And so the first question I asked this group of supervisors, and there were about 50 in the room, most of whom who had been there at least 15 years. I mean, these were competent, experienced people. And I said, how do you fire someone legally, uh, fire a student worker legally at your university? Well, it was like the Tower of Babel. Everybody had a different idea, and everyone's arguing. So I said, OK, write down your answer. And I waited till everyone wrote it down. And I said, let's do what my friend Kathy Bradshaw says. Let's do science. So we called up HR and had them bring over the manual. What we discovered was, of the 50 people in the room, four knew how to legally fire a student worker. They hadn't checked that the laws and rules had changed over the years. Um, we're humans. We have what we call historical memories, uh, revisionist memories. And a lot of people thought they knew, and over the years, it had morphed into something else. Only four people in the room had the right answer, right, according to what was legal. And then we found out what they had been doing. And I'll tell you, the, the um, dean was in the room, and he turned as white as a ghost, realizing that people had been doing things unethically and illegally for years, arguing with each other, but no one had ever gone to the document itself. So how well do you think you know all of the documents involve state personnel rules. You know, I own a little business. I have to know state personnel rules to run my business because, you know, things like workman's compensation, unemployment insurance, I have to know all of that stuff. Not in terrible detail, but well enough so I can have a conversation with our lawyer and our accountant about it. Um, how many say, yeah, I'm really good at using positive reinforcement? I'm, use, I'm very good at um, concise, sincere, frequent praise, touching base kind of praise, you know. And this, by the way, is one of the places where you tie what people are doing to the strategic plan. Like our, our big goal in 2015 is all about marketing. So Toby's doing some great work now. He's, he's uh, doing a bunch of coding on our website, kind of a version 2.0. And when he sends me a note and says, this is something I'm working on and accomplishing um, about stuff. I, I sent him a sentence. I said, this is terrific because this will be allowing us to reach these people. Thank you. So while he's sitting there in his little room, cubby hole, coding, he's thinking about this is helping us reach customers, which is part of the marketing plan. So he's got that connection with what we're doing. He doesn't get lost in the details. So how well are you at using positive reinforcement? How, are, how good are you at dealing with unhealthy conflict? Healthy conflict is when you have two good employees come up and say, we don't know whether or not to paint the front door red or blue, and we've been fighting about it for two days, so would you flip a coin so we can go back to work? Right? That's healthy conflict. Or someone says, I'm really upset about the new um, ILS that we're um, migrating to because I've talked to some friends at some other libraries and they say they're having real problems and I just for the record want to give you a list of what those problems and hope that we have vetted it. That's healthy conflict. Unhealthy conflict is I don't like the look on Pat's face. <laughs> right? Or unhealthy conflict is 23 years ago, right, you took my parking space and I have not been able to move on. Right? You know, I mean, all that stuff, I won't say bad words, but you know. So how well are you as a supervisor at dealing with that unhealthy conflict and basically getting people back to work and being civil with each other? They don't have to be their new best friend. I'm one of those people, when people say their library's just like a family, it's like a sick horror grabs my heart because I think, you know, most families are dysfunctional. So what that's telling me, you're bringing all like of the wacko, dysfunctional, crazed, sick things you did in your family to how you deal with other people in the workplace. No, we're going to be adults. We're going to, it's that joke about some, there's uh, someone in the room needs to be the adult, why not volunteer? So I want volunteer adults. And I've had some employees who have come from horrifying family 
settings. And they get it that that was then, this is now, and we do things differently here. We do things differently. You say good morning whether or not you feel like it. You're pleasant to people, right? Um, there's no hidden agendas and stuff. Uh, and by the way, I know this is not always in your control, but our office, we hire for emotional maturity first. I'm going to say something and I hope nobody's offended. I grew up in a medical family. Libraries are not the emergency room of children hospital. They are not nuclear power plants. It's just a library. Okay, and I realize that you want people who have certain levels of education and credentials, that's fine. But the first thing you want to hire for is the emotional maturity. And that needs to be above all because the truth is between you and me, you guys can teach people most of what they need to know and there's online classes and such, whatever the credentials are. But you want someone who above all has an even emotional keel, likes people. If they work at a front desk, they better darn well like teenage boys. And look at them with affectionate amusement. If you're upset by teenage boys, you should not work at a public or academic or school library in America. I'm sorry. Go find something else to do. And then, do you allow employees to be accountable? Are you a rescuer? Do you go in and fix things so you don't look bad? Or do you really say, we're going to be accountable? And by the way, if you're transi transitioning from a library where people were not held accountable and now they're held accountable, there are going to be people who are going to feel betrayed. I've worked here 10 years. Nobody complained about my work before. Well, that's true, and we apologize because now we know how to do it a different way. So yes, there is definitely a strategic shift going on and you will be held accountable for how well you do your work, both positive and negative. So just kind of give yourself a little one to 10 there and we're gonna come back to this. So again, you are evaluated on the work you do and in supervision, you are evaluated on the work your staff does. So let me pause here a moment and see, do people have any comments and questions about this little introduction so far? check and anything that comes in at the last minute we'll we'll pick up at the beginning of the, the second hour okay all right now here's some myths I'd like you to take a look at the myths on this slide um, that range from smart and educated people don't need supervision down to to need supervision is the same as failing and see if you can pick out one from this list that either you've heard or you're curious about you'd like a little bit more information about, it puzzles you, or you've run into before. So take a look at the list, and uh, they're on your slide handout as well, and see if there's one that just tickles your fancy, and we can talk about a couple of these really quick. But these are the main myths of supervision and library that I've run into over the years. Anyone see one that's familiar? If you do, raise your hand and let me call on you. Yes, please. Supervision comes naturally to most people. Yeah, supervision comes naturally to most people. That's a lie. Supervision is usually counterintuitive because the way you were raised to do things does not necessarily translate into a workplace. There was a study done by Saturn Car Company um, years ago about how long it took to take a really good employee, a top employee with 15 years experience, and teach them how to be a good supervisor. And what they found was that to become a good supervisor you needed the equivalent of 300 classroom hours. 300 classroom hours. Now I'm not saying just sitting in a classroom, but all that you knew. And usually it took at least two years on the job as a supervisor working for a great supervisor to have a clue. Now the good news is most of us figure out in the first two years kind of where we are. But I have heard so many times people say, but that Pat, she's so smart, how come she can't supervise? That's a skill set. There's a lot of things I'm great at. I am terrific at honesty. If you give me your bank deposit for a million dollars, 
every dollar will be there when I deposit in the bank. But please don't ask me to clean your house. I'm kind of like that Dave Barry joke about I wasn't born with that gene. Most women, I think, have the gene about cleaning house. Many men do. My husband does. I don't. I don't have that gene. So there's a lot of great people out there. They don't have that gene. So don't be surprised if you promote someone to supervisor at your library and you think they're great at their technical and professional skills, but they don't make it as a supervisor. So it takes constant training. And my mentors, one of my mentors in supervision is a gentleman who's in his 90s now, whose career was as a Methodist minister. And when I started teaching this stuff 30 years ago, I would come and visit him and his wife in Wisconsin and talk to him about what I was doing. And he said, you know, I did supervision and management in my career um, as a minister, and I always was learning something new. Always learning something new. Yeah, that's a big one. Does anyone else have one? Yeah, people, it's super, you know, like, and, and that doesn't work in the United States of America so good. Has anyone noticed that Americans aren't, like, really the most obedient people on the planet? It also doesn't work on most of the planet, um, partly because human beings have their own ideas. Now, once in a while, I'll have someone in a class who served in the military, God bless them, and they will say, well, when I was in the military, when I was in, you know, NAM, or when I was this or that, I could just tell people what to do. And I said, yes, that's because you're trained in war to tell people to kill people, and they have to be obedient. But again, you're not running a nuclear power plant or a children's hospital. You're, you're dealing with human beings. And I have had the honor of doing classes at places like West Point, the Navy War College in Rhode Island, where I'm working with officers who go through incredible training. And when we come to this stuff, they said, oh, you betcha. You know, we have to use positive reinforcement because it's not just that we are given the rank to have trust and respect. We have to earn the trust and respect of the people we work for and with every single day. And that's the difference between an adequate supervisor in the armed forces and a great supervisor. A great supervisor knows that if they treat the men and women who work with them for trust and respect every day, people will say, since it's you asking, I'll do it. But the ones who don't learn very quickly how jeeps can disappear <laughs> and mail can disappear and paperwork doesn't get done. You know, and I asked uh, a colonel I was working with in, in, yeah, I'm bragging now, in the um, Air Force, at Andrews Air Force Station, he says, but isn't it great being a supervisor where you could just like shoot people, you know, if they don't do what you want? He said, well, first of all, Pat, it's sort of frowned on. And he said, the second thing, it's very expensive. There's trials and you have to justify yourself. And then they just are going to bring me someone else. So he said, I've learned that shooting is something I don't do. And by the way, that was the idea that, that um, also came up with the title of the dog, Don't Shoot the Dog. So here's the supervision myths. And some people say, oh, no, I believe them. Well, actually, but they're not, they don't work. They don't work. So why do we need supervision? There's three big ideas. First of all, we have to coordinate what we all do. And a supervisor even in the 21st century, it's sort of like, okay, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this. And you're stepping back and having a big picture of what's going on. Right now, I only have one employee, but I have to coordinate what that one employee does with myself and with my husband. At the beginning of 2014, I had five employees. And a good part of my job was coordinating what these five extremely bright self-starters were doing on the different projects they were working on. The second thing is, it goes back to the strategic plan, connecting them with the big picture. Why are we doing this? Because smart, technical, and professional people get lost in the details of what they're doing. They get lost in the details. And they will, and, and here's a typical thing. We do a lot of webinar design. And um, we are of the school that puts content first. Um, legibility is important, and then we get to do all the pretty graphics and, and pretty stuff, depending on the client. And I had a superb, amazing art director working for me for two and a half years. She went off to San Francisco a couple of months ago and is now working for a big <coughs> national company. She was awesome. And as good as Bronwyn was as a designer and a director, I had to remind her about once every two weeks, it's not just about the pretty designs. 
we're educators. We're educators. What you're doing is hopefully engaging people so they remember and use the information we're giving them. And these images you're coming up with are terrific and they're obscure and they would look great on the wall of an art museum and they are not going to speak to the people who we're working with and for. And that's part of what you do as a supervisor because we're all too close to our own stuff. And the smarter we are and the longer we do our work, the more likely that is to happen. Second, um, and the third rather, is to elicit the best and keep us growing. So there's very specific things that we want to keep in mind when we're supervisors. This is kind of a summary. We're not going to go into it much on page 14, but this whole thing of workplace contracts. And all I'm going to say is that one of your homework projects is to make sure that you're up to speed with your HR department, your director, all the folks about what you can and can't do as a supervisor in your part of the country. And I have been in counties in Illinois where every village um, attorney had a different interpretation of state personnel law. So the rule of thumb is the person who will tell you what's right and wrong at the end of the day is the attorney who would represent your library in court with the trustees or however you're governed as an academic school or public library or a special library as well. So you don't get advice from your sister-in-law who's a real estate attorney and you don't get advice from somebody at another library in another municipality. You have to work with what the attorney and the governing board, which might be your town council, city council, whatever, have decided is right and it might be different from what the people down the road are doing. Okay, so make sure that you don't get blindsided by that. So what I'm going to do before we take our first break, I'd like to go over these things about what's in a contract and agreement, and then when we come back, we're going to finish up the slides and go through some of the other information. So if you're either here or at a distance, if you want to take a look when we come back from about a five-minute break, we'll collect with other questions we have so far and then plunge into the more material. So this is actually contract law. And when I say an agreement, I'm not talking about a big bureaucratic thing. It might be even the memo you give person when you uh, have assigned them a new program to do. You know, like what, what are we doing with the programming? You know, you decide to do maybe something big, like you're going to have a big maker space fair event or something like that, or um, you've decided to expand the scope of summer reading. Um, you're bringing in a new collection, you're working on the strategic plan, there's all sorts of reasons. And when you work with people a long time, we get careless. We treat people like family. So my husband and I have been together 38 years. There's a lot of stuff we don't write down, you know. But you know what? Every single time that either I make a mistake or my husband makes a mistake, it's because we didn't write things down. And we're getting older in our memory. I mean, my brain is like Swiss cheese. Anyone else here? My mother says, your brain is like a sieve. And that's exactly how I feel these days. And I tell um, Toby, who's less than half my age, write things down. Guess what? His productivity has improved. Because if I'm not there, he can look at the list he's working on and say, oh, yeah, we talked about this. You are required in my office to bring paper and pen or your computer device to every meeting and write things down. Whatever documents we give you, you write things down. So, first of all, if you have an agreement, what is each person responsible for? What are they responsible for? So, for Toby, he's responsible for updating the website. He's responsible for keeping the computer stuff going. He's responsible for backups. He's responsible for some of the design work that we do. And I swear if you call Toby up right now at our house in Denver, he could tell you what he was responsible for. And he'd have pieces of paper in front of them. So on a busy day, he wouldn't have to remember. He knows what needs to be done and why. And the why is always tying it into the strategic plan. He knows 2015, 2015 is our big marketing year. And these are why we're doing the things. And these are some of the goals that we set. You know, how many um, new libraries are we signing up for webinars? What are our financial goals that we have to meet because we have budget goals and stuff? Toby's got all that written down. He knows why. 
He knows what the budgets and resources are available. He knows the constraints on the budget. I absolutely believe in transparency and financial information in any size enterprise. And I tell people that you should operate your libraries, whatever the library structure is, even if it's an association or nonprofit library, that follows your state open meeting laws in terms of transparency. So there may be some information, but Toby can tell you what our monthly budget is. He knows what our accounts receivable and accounts payables are. He knows what big bills are coming up. He knows this. You know what? Even if that information falls into the hands of the North Koreans, it's not the end of the republic. So he gets that financial information. So you know what? He can make good decisions when I'm not there. And when he goes to my husband and asks for a check about something, we know kind of like what the budget is for a project. And we'll mention it, like, you know, keep it under so much. And he's allowed to make certain purchases without checking in with us if it's below a certain amount. And if it's above a cer certain amount, he checks in with my husband and myself. And we talk about it and we make the decision. Deadlines. He knows all the deadlines. He knows when something has to happen. He also knows what the priorities are. This is more important than this. This is more important than this. And I'm talking about a 35-year-old high school dropout, guys. <laughs> I'm not talking about someone with, a, with a, a master's degree in library science or a PhD. He's an extremely bright, personable guy. And one of the reasons we hired him is he loves to learn. He's voracious, hungry to learn new things, and he's got a terrific personality, and he worked in sales and customer service for two big companies. And maybe some of you will actually even meet him someday, you know, online or something. He's terrific. He's terrific at what he does. He knows the consequences, positive and negative. He knows what we have to watch out for about things, and he knows what's really, really important whether or not it's 100% rational. And notice what is missing, though, the how. For most of what we, he does, we don't tell him how to do his job. We tell him the goals, what needs to be done. But as he grows in his skill set, how he does it is up to him. So we check in about every two or three hours, like, how's it going? But he tells me how he solves problems. He tells me what he needs. Sometimes he says, I'd like to get this book because it'll help me on this thing. We look at it and say, yeah, great. And more and more, he comes to my husband, who's been in computers for 50 years, and says, this is how I'm fixing this thing. Do you see any problems with it? 99 times out of 100, we say no about things. So this is what's in the agreement. But notice, it's not about how he does his job. So when we come back, again, we're going to finish the slides. We're going to take a five-minute energy break and, and such. It's, it's warm in this room here, and there's, I've used up most of the oxygen. So I'm going to go back to the break slide that we had before. And we'll see what people come up with, and we'll check in with you in five minutes. Very good. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you could join us again, and I'm going to check in with Joe and see if anyone um, out of our Auslanders have any questions or comments at this point. Nothing from there. Um, anyone from the audience so far? We've already covered a lot of material, and I want to see if there's any questions or comments so far from anyone here about this. Yeah, please. Um. since I've gotten there have made my staff much happier at working in where they are than, I'm sorry to say, the other building, because they are getting rewarded, they're getting noticed, and they're getting acknowledged for the work that they do. This is the thing about acknowledgement. Um, there's a book called 
uh, first break all the rules. And again, I don't know who comes up with these titles. It's a, it's a terrible title for a book. But it's based on an extraordinary study that was done by the Gallup Poll Organization where they interviewed 50,000 employees across numerous workplaces to find out what makes a good supervisor and manager. And one of the top complaints people had was, it's like I work in a black hole. The only time I see my supervisor is when I've done something wrong. And it's kind of like somebody who goes up to a child or their pet or their spouse only to complain. Um, years ago, there was a terrific guy named Mike Jogstetter who was the state librarian in North Dakota. He's no longer with us. He's a wonderful guy, grew up in a military family, and he learned a lot about his supervisory skills from the military, and he, he was a tech guy, actually, before he was a state librarian. And I loved going up to Bismarck and walking through the state library with Mike, because when we walk into a department, people would look up from their work and see their boss and it was like a light went on in the room. People would grin, they would smile, there'd be jokes, like they were happy to see him because he understood the power of praise. He understood that. We're, we're going to talk more about that this morning. Um, on the other hand, there's another director I know, nice guy, not a bad person, not a bad person, not a yeller or anything like that in a large library district in the Midwest very smart man, and he had been there 35 years. When I'd walk around with him in his library, people would have the, oh my God, he's coming, look busy, look busy, right? People would look down, and I'd call it the death cone of silence would descend on the department. Now, he wasn't a bad person, but he would tell me, I'm really busy. So the only time people heard from him was when they did something wrong, or he wanted something from them. He thought it was efficient to do that. He thought it was efficient to do that. And I love the fact that when people work for me, my husband, and my husband is real smart and can be extremely intimidating just because he's from Vulcan and, you know, and really smart. And so you know, we're all earthlings naturally kind of intimidated by Vulcans. But once they get to know him, it's really fun when he leaves his office to come into the, the greater part of the office to talk to people, watching people light up because even if there's something bad to talk about, he's going to be kind, understanding, sympathetic, and so on. People don't have to brace themselves. You can often watch people physically brace themselves dealing with a, um, let's say, a clueless, not an incompetent, but a clueless supervisor. And I'll tell you a secret. Um, it's been a pleasure working around the country, and I visit 50 to 100 libraries each year, Literally, I've worked with libraries in 48 states. So when I show up, oftentimes the director or manager says, oh, I want to show you all the new cool things we have, and here's this, and here's this, and everything. What they don't know is I'm not looking at the new cool stuff. I'm watching how they interact with their staff. Do they stop to say hello? Are they eager to tell me something cool the person's doing? Or am I the important person that they ignore their staff while they're out on the floor, or only talk to people of a certain status about things. And it's very telling. And guess what? When I sit down often to talk then about the problems they see that they're hoping I address, guess what? I can almost anticipate them based on how that director is treating their staff that day. And I've even watched things and actually said, is, is, that, is that what you do every day? Or is today special for some reason? You know, because if that's the tone of voice you use with your staff, I have an inkling about why we have some of the problems that we do. So let me go ahead and speaking of technology, going to flip forward. So we have an idea here about what supervision is, why we need it, what these workplace contracts are, and what are some of the agreement elements. Now for everyday things you do with people, no, you don't need this stuff. But somewhere this should be available to people. And whenever you have a committee, an interdepartmental project, a big project working on, people should know these kinds of who, what, when, where, whys, and how much to be able to do their job. If you do this well, you put me out of business, and I can go back to my original career choice, which was country and western backup singer. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about positive reinforcement, and then we're going to be going to the handout later this morning so we can play a little bit with this. But it's based on behavioral psychology. Be behavioral psychology, the main idea is cause and effect. That you do something and something happens. 
And so, as we've said before, it's about consequences. And most of the consequences people should experience is something positive. And when we say a negative consequence, we mean something that is meaningful and significant to someone. And everybody has different consequences. So we're not going to just do a cookie cutter kind of thing. It must be fair and equitable. And this, folks, is where it gets tough because there are some people in the world we're going to like better than others. There are some people in the world we are going to feel more comfortable with us ourselves. There was a study done reported a few years ago by the BBC and it was about the likability factor in people's faces. Now this is what they did. I thought it was so cool. They sat people down at computers and in front of them were two faces and they had to pick which one they liked the best, which looked more likable. Then they put up two more faces, two more, and they kept doing it. But what they weren't telling people is there was a camera in the computer who was taking an actual picture of the person sitting at the desk, at the, at the computer screen, and taking their features and starting to morph their features into one of the people they were looking at. So as you went on through the program, one of the photos looked more and more like you, right? Guess what? Guess which face people found more likable? The one that looked more like the person sitting, I mean, themselves. It's things, you know? Now, this becomes a problem. I'm a middle-aged, middle-class, white, college-educated woman. I can walk into most libraries in America and get better service than a 14-year-old Hispanic boy because I tend to look not just in terms of ethnicity, but age and everything like the person on the other side of the counter. I know the vocabulary of libraries. I can say authority control without like just laughing hysterically. So, you know, it's like I, I smell like one of them. I smell like one of you. People think, I mean, I go to libraries and people think I'm a reference librarian and they'll stop me for help and I say, sure, let's find the encyclopedias together. So, yes, I have, com I have broken the federal statute of impersonating a reference librarian <laughs> without a master's degree. Yes, I have done that. So favoritism becomes something that's very difficult, particularly if you have terrific productive employees who you genuinely like better than others. And this is where training comes in and oversight on your work as a supervisor. Take favoritism complaints seriously because they're often based on nonverbal signals that you're sending people that you don't even know. It needs to be appropriate for the action. And the downside, as we know, of positive reinforcement is great inflation, right? Oh, you're so wonderful because you wore clothes today at work. Okay, there's some things, come on, about stuff. So let's just not be perky about stuff, but be reasonable. You know, Toby gets very specific reinforcement about what he's doing based on actual accomplishment actual accomplishment. He doesn't get, oh, thank you for showing up because you're wonderful. But I do tell him that I appreciate the fact that he takes the bus to work and most of the time he's on time. And I know it takes some extra effort to do it because we have a terrible bus system in Denver. I mean, it's terrible about things. It must be sincere. If you don't mean it, don't say it. And if you don't like our species, don't be a supervisor. It's just like if you don't like children, don't become a teacher or a children's librarian. And if you work in a public library and you don't like children, don't work in a public library. Okay? I mean, really. This, this, this is ridiculous. And, and I'm saying this because I've actually been brought into situations where I have a children's librarian who doesn't like children. And I'm like, oh, just fire her. You know, save your money. You don't even have to bring me out. And if you're talking about motivation, it's really about human beings. And this is where we want to be smart about the interpersonal skills. I heard a great thing from a library director a couple years ago. She said, a supervisor should know their staff well enough to get them the appropriately themed birthday card. Right? So we, when we've had like large staff and people, it's always fun, like people will get my husband something usually that's music themed or football themed or he's from Texas, something with Texas or something with books with me, it'll be cats or gardening or cooking with um, 
Toby, our employee, it'll be something like he's a martial arts guy. It's kind of fun having an employee who could kill you, you know, like with his finger. And he's about this tall, and he's having, I'm, I'm missing some of the drama, but he came a little beaten up to work this week because he was in a sparring, a Brazilian jitsu sparring match, <laughs> which I thought was kind of, you know, sort of fun. So, um, but we also know he loves photography. Now, remember, these aren't like intimate details of someone's life. This is just the everyday thing of what someone cares about. That's kind of the level of intimacy we're talking about with a supervisor. You should know enough about the person that they say, wow. That card tells me that you actually have been listening and paying attention to what's important to me. That's pretty cool. So we want to not have a cookie cutter approach to stuff. And that means, again, the interpersonal skills are important. You need to hire people and promote people to supervision who have empathy for other human beings, who can see, hear, and understand the world from the other person's point of view. That's the interpersonal skill part of what we're talking about with supervision. Now, there are some workplaces that everybody's a Vulcan. Um, my husband's a high-tech guy. In addition to his work in economics, he worked for a very large computer company as a consultant for about 25 years. And he didn't have to do any touchy-feely stuff, partly because he earned trust and respect because of his superior skills. However, at the same time, he was always civil to everyone. He said, good morning. To the, to the supervisory staff. He would say good morning to the receptionist and bring her gifts of hard candy. He would say please and thank you. He had impeccable boarding school manners. And people thought of him as nice, but he wasn't like, you know, effusive about stuff. I had a lady a couple of years ago, um, a library manager, come up to me at an ALA, and we were doing something like this, and at break she said, well, she said, I have a young man, and I'm exaggerating now, but she said, I have a young man who works for me, and this was in California, and she said, he's so rude to me. And I said, how is he rude? She said, well, when he comes by my desk in the morning, he goes, yo, mama, looking good. And I said, <laughs> I think you need to get out more because he's actually complimenting you. And from his world, as a 19-year-old hipster, that's a compliment. I'd be terribly flattered if a 19-year-old boy walked by and went, yo, mama, looking good. You know. So we always have people who come from different cultures, ages, backgrounds in the workplace, and they have different ways of doing things. So we've got to loosen up a little bit about this stuff as well. So we will be coming back and doing some exercises in a few minutes related to positive reinforcement. But here's the formula. This is the secret formula. This is a summary of the book called Don't Shoot the Dog. And um, we will take a couple of these ideas right away um, and do a little exercise as a group with them as well. First of all, and this is interesting, you want to catch people when they're doing something right, when you're doing positive reinforcement. And one of the problems is, is that if that person is on your radar as a problem employee, your radar will only tell you when they're doing things wrong. And this is a real test of the favoritism issue. When people say, well, they never do anything right, and I say, actually, that's not true. Human beings are not robots. What this is telling me is you're not paying attention. Not that they're doing everything wrong. You, as the supervisor, are not paying attention. This is like basic, you know, human animal training 101 about things. And, and by the way, it's a really interesting self-check if any of you also supervise supervisors. You want to listen to people who come and complain to you all the time about an employee. Um, some of you may know the Yiddish word kvetch, which means complaining for personal entertainment. So if you have kvetchers on the staff who just want to complain about someone, a great way to stop and is say, great, now tell me three things good about this employee. And if you can't, go back until you can. They should be, most of the time, being able to say things, even if I see them trying. You know, or they have these good technical skills, but not the interpersonal skills, or vice versa. And then we want to tell them they're doing it right. There's this issue, interesting issue in linguistics and semantics that my husband talks about a lot in his work, that if we can't name something, it's really hard to manage it. And the um, great image he has is of a bunch of people 
who are splashing in water, and they have their hands cupped and their hands out, and they're splashing and they're floating and they're moving in the water. They're doing this thing. And then somebody comes by and says, oh, that's called swimming. You're swimming. Oh, I am? Yeah, you're swimming. Now let me show you some cool things about swimming that we have figured out after 10,000 years. And we know all these cool things about swimming. It's like, hey, I'm swimming. So you want to name the thing. Name the thing. I find it sometimes useful when you're trying to get someone to do something like a nonverbal thing, like at a, a front desk with library users, and they're not quite getting it. So you're listening when they do it right, and you want to immediately, as soon as you can, go up to them and say, you know the use, that voice you used just now with Mr. Smith, who's still so per difficult, that was perfect. That was exactly what I was talking about. Thank you so much. And that may be the first time in the person's life someone identified, nobody told me before that was the tone of voice. They'd say, well, use a better tone of voice. That doesn't give you any information about what to do or what not to do. So we catch them when we're doing it right, which means we're changing our focus to the things people are doing right. We tell them they're doing it right. So we've named it and labeled it, and then we reward them for doing it right. And the reward is the smile, the acknowledgement, and at the kind of the, the gold level, if you were, of people who do um, different kinds of supervision, it's even today in America, the written note, the handwritten note, um, a note on a business card, um, or even just the nice thank you. I, uh, last week, I did a webinar for a large library system in Georgia. And much to my surprise, I got a, a beautiful note uh, before I left for the Midwest this week from the director, who I never met. Um, but she sat in on the program. And it was a very specific note about, this is what you did well. This is what my staff reported. This is how it was useful to us. And this is how we use it in the future. And she did it in five sentences. I thought, whoa. I can tell why people like working for her. you know, because And, and I got the note in 72 hours, which I was pretty impressed after, after that. You know. She didn't have to do that. I don't work for her. I'm a vendor who maybe, I think I'm doing another project for them in October. It wasn't that big a deal. But boy, I remembered it. And put it this way, she's now in my pantheon of systems I can recommend to people to work for. If you get to work for that lady, you know, go for it. There are some places in America that I really believe the best thing for the library, if they fire everyone, burn the place down, salt the earth, and try again in five years. But that definitely is not worth it. So you catch them, you tell them, you reward them. So here's the question for the folks here in the audience, um, with our audience here in Burr, uh, Burr Ridge and our audience in the ether. What's hard about doing these things? What's hard about catch them doing it right, tell them doing it right, and reward them for doing it right? What's, what's difficult about this? Anyone, raise your hand if you have a suggestion, please. Oh, you're not there with them. And you know what? Here's one of the secret awful things about supervision. You can't supervise from a distance. That's the immense lie that we tell ourselves. Oh, good. They've just made you in charge of 43 branches, right? And they're all like 500 miles away from each other. And you're lucky if you even visit a branch once a month. I have a lot of heated conversations with trustees and directors about the fallacy of naming someone a supervisor if they don't have quality time with the people they're supervising. And it's because of all the stuff that happens. Um, where I see it a lot, even in good libraries, is second shift and weekends, right? Where there's nobody, quote, in charge. And uh, one of our libraries in Colorado was having some problems, brought me in. We, we had a very serious shut down the library meeting with the whole staff. And that's when we found out that people on weekends and evenings were unintentionally doing illegal stuff. I'm not saying they, they were like dealing, you know, like arms or anything like that. But their behavior with people was like really, really bad. And the poor director was stunned. She had no idea. And I said, it is a false economy to think that you should not have somebody supervising about stuff. So that's, that's an issue I deal with a lot. And I know it's a money issue, but there's a thing about um, 
false capacity, that aren't we proud that we figured out a way to save money so people don't have to be supervised a lot. And I say, well, guess what? They're not being supervised. And there will be an attrition in customer skills, training, consistency of service, and you are a public sector agency. All these things that may not happen today, may not happen tomorrow, but will be a downward slide over the months. And then you'll say, oh, well, they were supervised. What's the problem? It's that pesky time-space continuum, ladies and gentlemen. This issue came up in Colorado a few years ago, and I called two of my uh, mentors who are both incredibly skilled men who have both of them PhDs in behavioral science and they work with multinational corporations uh, and I talked about this issue of am I wrong about supervision in person and they both they don't even know each other and they said the same thing you can't supervise from a distance they said uh, most of the stuff about high-powered self-directing work teams is a myth where they do work, it's because you happen to have a workplace full of Vulcans. But you know, even when my husband was working for that high tech company, he would check in at least two or three times a day by phone and he'd go see them once a week and sit down and talk to his immediate supervisor who was the head of engineering and actually have a conversation face to face about the tech work that he was doing. And everything he did was visible to any of the other engineers who were working on this big project about stuff. So um, I find, and you know what, this is something I changed my mind about over 35 years. There was a time that I didn't think this was necessary. Now I think it's necessary, particularly with all the changes that libraries are going through. What else is difficult about doing this model in real life? Anyone else? Please. We are so uh, focused looking on the negative that we don't see the positive. And that's the most common people, things people say. And we want to listen for it in each other and in ourselves. It's one place to listen for is your family. When you go home and you vent about the workplace, does your family tell you, you know, you only say bad things about this person? In fact, I had, my husband and I had this encounter over one of his clients, I said, if I just mirror back what you're saying, honey, you haven't said a nice thing about Dave in six months. Well, you know, I come home and vent to my wife. No, no. I said, you haven't said a good thing about Dave in six months. Either you should quit the contract or see him differently. But this is feedback he's getting. Do we have any folks out there, Joe? Yeah. Um, you know, the comment that follow through is hard and the fact that there are also different management styles um, within the different supervisors. Ooh, first of all, yes, it is, it is hard. That thing about the management styles is very interesting. It's kind of like a corollary to parenting styles. There has to be some alignment on how people decide to supervise and manage. There can't be so much difference that employees are confused or irritated because the styles are so different. And when we talk about styles, Again, this not only isn't brain surgery, but we're also not saying that what we're asking people to do is outside the skill set of most average people. This is definitely well within the bell curve of what people can do. And so if there is a, quote, big difference in management styles, that actually is a red flag for me, that the managers aren't talking to each other, that the supervisors aren't talking to each other, um, and you particularly see it when people are bouncing around from department to apartment, if they're floating, not just between departments, but between branches as well. There's an efficiency issue here. If every branch runs so differently, it can't just be a personality cult. There has to be some agreement. And when does there have to be some agreement? When it's affecting employees and affecting employees' interactions with customers and productivity as well. Very good. Very good. So this is a thing about managing conflict. We're just going to cover this very quickly. We're almost done with the slides. And then we're going to start doing some of these exercises as well. And the question is, is when we are dealing with conflict, is it a personal issue or a personnel issue? How many people have ever been confronted with the idea of whether something is a personnel issue or a personal issue? 
right? Like when, when do you interfere and when don't you? When do you have to kind of walk on by? Uh, supervisors learn to just like walk on by and ignore the dirty dishes. There's some things you just, I don't want to know <laughs> what's going on and that's, that's okay for those things. But the main reasons that you should interfere is first and foremost, is it impacting the library user? So there are behaviors that people can get away with in a back room that they can't get away with in a front desk. And that's just it. I'm, you know, um, people sometimes think that the front desk of a library, a service desk in a public or academic or school library is uh, basically an extension of their living room. You know, they, they can gossip, they can chew gum on the phone while they're talking to someone, uh, they can have the place a hysterical mess, uh, they can have long, long cell phone and phone conversations with family members, they can have family members being standing there at a service desk while they're yelling at the family member while there's library users waiting to be waited on, and I've seen it, I've seen it, you know. Um, so if it impacts the library customer, yes, you step in. If it affects productivity, now affecting productivity usually isn't just about, oh, Pat had that annoying look on her face again. Affecting productivity is Pat's been late on getting her reports out, which means there's a domino effect and other people are being late as well. That's when we know it's a productivity issue. Breaking a rule. For almost everyone who's watching or attending this program today, you probably don't remember this, but there was a day that you came down to breakfast and looked at your roommate or your cat or your family and put your hand over your heart and said, I've decided to work for the government. Do you remember that day, right? You've all decided to work for the government, which means you have rules you have to enforce and those rules that you enforce have, in many cases, the forces of a written law and you have to enforce them equally for everybody. You have to earn the public trust. You are stewards of public property. So you have stricter ethical standards than people like myself in the private sector or even in the nonprofit sector, regardless of what you do. And there are people who think they're above the rules. How many people have ever worked with someone like that? Yeah, that's something supervisors and managers have to nail about stuff because those are the folks who think they are justified in doing what they need to do and bypass all of the things we have in place in the public sector. And does it raise the cost of doing business? And this is where the personal things are. Um, how many people have, have um, ever heard the phrase walking on eggshells? All right. Okay. So. What happens when you walk in, and I'll, I'll pick on Denise, what happens if you walk into your workplace and Denise is your branch manager and you have bad news to tell her? First thing I do is I say, is, is Denise in a good mood today? Is, is, is she in a good mood? Because I have real bad news to tell her. Oh, she's in a bad mood. Oh, okay, I'll put it off telling her a week or two. Oh, gee. Has any one of us, and I bet every one of us has hesitated sometimes with our hand on a doorknob or walking into someone's office saying, isn't there some way I can procrastinate talking to this person because I have to be so tender around them? Has anyone a long time ago ever worked with that person that I'm talking about where you had to be careful? That costs your institution a heck of a lot of money and time because important decisions and communications are put off. God forbid anyone attending today is that person. We'll just assume you're not that person. But one of the things with everybody who's ever worked with me over the years that we've had to drum into them from day one is there is never a reason to be afraid to talk to us. You can come up and you can yell at us, you can talk to us about stuff. You know, if, if the door is closed on life's office and it's important, just go right in. Don't worry about knocking even if it's important. And, but we have to back it with action. So when um, one of the people who just left us for a better job um, blew up our entire, our entire Dropbox file and lost about a thousand documents uh, and she was crying. I mean, she came into my office and she was crying, I just destroyed Dropbox, and I said, that's why we invented backups. And go see Leif, oh, I'm too afraid. And I said, go see my husband, tell him what you did. Because my husband has all these wonderful stories about expert computer people 
destroying the financial systems of banks and things like that. And he's sitting there laughing. He says, oh, let me tell you what I did. So now, after it usually takes about a month, then the staff comes in and says, oh, can I tell you what I just did? And I said, okay, do we have to call 911? No, okay, we're cool. And then we go, oh boy, you know, all right, let's fix that again. Um, but no one has to be afraid of telling us the truth. Um, if you have people who are tiptoeing around other people, that's sufficient for me, even if it's vague, ver you know, nonverbal stuff or whatever. And then finally, do you have people who are using emotional intimidation because you as a supervisor are too afraid to step in and stop it? Sometimes we like bullies. And the reason we like people who use emotional intimidation is sometimes we let them do our dirty work. And there's some people out there, I, I have some friends who work in Hollywood, and they tell us that there's some people out there who are beloved public celebrities who are really awful people because they are the wonderful, sweet public celebrity, but it's their business manager who does the cruel firing and who's nasty to people and yells at them and stuff. I've seen the same thing in libraries. The beloved director with the heart of gold, but it's their head of branches who's the person who everyone hates and abhors. So we want to make sure that our not doing our good supervisory thing is not creating a field for bullies running the workplace as effect. So here's kind of my short form, again, of what to do when you have to do an intervention. How many people have had to do the intervention where you have two people stuck in unhealthy conflict? Have you ever had to do this? I believe that one reason we're hesitant to do these things is we don't know what to do. So the book, Dick Rhodes' book, Discipline Without Punishment, actually has scripts in it. But this is the short form today that you can use. And we'll take a look at it, and then once again, I'm going to ask you for feedback about what you think might be difficult about doing this. Okay, so while we're going through this, think about that, and then I'll check in with you again. First and foremost is you meet with everybody together. One of the biggest mistakes, and I know there's some trainers out there who promote this, I'm not of that camp. You can't do the he said, she said with people not in the room. You bring the people together, and if they start saying, oh, well, I can't talk with them in the room, you have a very simple thing you say. Fine, if you folks choose not to discuss it, that's okay, because then I will make the decision about what should be done, and trust me, you're both gonna be unhappy. We have to have adults, ladies and gentlemen. We can't work with people who are eight years old who say, oh, well, I don't like you all. I'm not gonna say anything. Everything's fine, nothing. I mean, you know, that's a game that can go on for months and years, right? And we've seen it happen. So we put them both in the same room. And by the way, I've had to do it, and it's difficult, and people cry, and they emotionally intimidate, and sometimes they yell at each other and so on. Then you assume everyone is telling the truth from their point of view, even if they are known to you as be a liar. And this is where you want your good skills about let's hear from each person and hear everyone's story first. And do that as best to your ability. And if they refuse to tell their story or talk about it, say, I understand, however, you are putting me in the position that I will have to make a decision without your input, which I don't want to do. You know, and sometimes you have to do it more than once to do it. You have no power over the past. Okay, this is the only dorky thing I'm gonna ask you to do today. Would everyone please repeat after me, I have no power over the past. One, two, three. I have no power over the past. Very good. So people wanna tell you their story about what happened in 1983. Nope, it's about what's gonna to happen tomorrow. Saves you a lot of time. You are not a therapist. I am not a therapist. I don't have to hear the same stories over and over again. It's about what's gonna happen in the future. And that's when you start setting the goals and consequences of what your expectation is of what's gonna happen differently. Okay, you hate each other, that's fine. This is a workplace, you get a paycheck. Can you be civil with each other? And the evidence, and this is very important, the evidence is that I no longer get complaints from empl other employees or library users about your behavior. Nobody's coming up to me as the director and saying, those people on first shift, I don't even want to come into the library when they're both there on first shift, all right? Um, so we want to say no complaints about things. 
And that's one of those things that's neat because you don't have to be there, right? You don't have to be there to observe what's been going on. And the gold standard, and, I, and the stuff that I teach is very like the center of the road, vanilla supervision for folks. It's not fancy stuff at all. The gold standard in my world is weekly check-ins. So when you meet with the folks about what needs to be done, and you set what the goals are and the consequences, positive and negative, and usually in a library it will be when the termination process starts, disciplinary process starts, then the weekly check-ins basically say, great, see you 3 o'clock on Friday. And that's where we're going to talk about what happened in the coming week. And by the way, these check-in uh, things usually can take three minutes. It's not, it doesn't have to be that big a deal. And then you say, this is great, guys. No complaints. Things are going great. Wonderful. See you next Friday, 3 o'clock. Usually takes about three months of weekly meetings so that it doesn't fall off people's radar. What they're used to it is eventually you'll forget and things can slide. When people tell me the problem I have with doing an intervention and setting an agreement is that slide back and it's said, because you as the supervisor have stopped paying attention. And then what you do is you want to be able to say, you know what, it's been six months since that problem happened. You guys are doing great. Thank you very much. It is saving the library so much time and money. I had a huge blow up between two of my employees three years ago. Massive blow up with people yelling at each other and everything and coming to me to say I want the other person fired. And we work out of our house. So I dragged them both into the backyard, sat them on chairs, got them something cold to drink and said we're going to work on this. And we spent about a half an hour with them telling each of their sides of the story and I said okay. So you're telling me it's a personality conflict. That's kind of like saying, you know, the sky is blue. So, and? And I said, so, you have a choice. Do you want to both go home right now with pay, come back tomorrow, and tell me if you want to work here or not, or do you want to work it out yourselves? You're both adults, and let me know what happens. And they looked at each other, and they said, we'll work it out ourselves. So we left them in the backyard for two hours about this stuff. Within two weeks, they were best friends and work together beautifully for the rest of the year. They were just like misunderstandings. Some of them cultural, because they'd come from such different backgrounds, missing signals and stuff like that. And um, so it worked out well. Sometimes it doesn't work out that well. So I always prepare for the worst and stuff. And then we cultivate a safe environment. And a safe environment means that people can come to you, but what they know is going to happen is we are held accountable. So people come learn that we don't really tolerate a lot of venting. We really don't tolerate a lot of venting. If you have a problem, let's fix the problem. If it's serious enough that you have to call, talk to a boss, let's fix it and figure it out. Because what I don't like is things festering and blowing up in my face three years later because it wasn't taken care of. So. This is sort of a very simplistic view of how to do an intervention. Let me pause here and see what questions or comments people might have. I want to make sure that we finish the slides so that we can get to some of the written exercises soon. But see, either you have a comment, a question, or a concern about why you don't think it might work for you. Anyone have any comments at this point? And again, if you do, just raise your hand. Is this sort of making sense so far? And by the way, if you have a team of managers, you want everyone on the same page to learn how to do this together and come up with norms about how are we going to help each other do this in a respectful way. Yes? Sometimes people will have a problem with another employee mm -hmm. and they want something to be done about it. They want it to get better. And so they will tell me or one mm -hmm. of but they do not want that person to know that they Well, I'm sorry. If there's no secrets. Secrets, the, the question is, someone wants, says they have a problem with another employee. They want to tell mom, but they don't want the other person to know. Secrets are ways to manipulate people. You can't have secrets in a workplace. And you have to tell people, it's not my secret to keep. 
because that it immediately keeps you from doing action. What they hope is that, that you'll intervene, right? That they will recruit you to be the rescuer without them having to be accountable. So I warn people who work for me, we don't keep secrets here. My mom taught me this, by the way. My mom um, served, when she was younger, served on a lot of public boards, and my dad was an elected official for a while. You know, they did that kind of thing. So my mother would be at the grocery store, and she said, it was always when you're trying to make the decision about the melon. You know, and that's like pretty high grade cognitive work to decide if the melon's ripe. You know, and you're thumping it and you're smelling it and Ma's working on the melon and here comes someone says, Esther, listen, I really need your help. Now this has to be a big secret, but I'm hoping that I can get your support for this particular project and on and on. And my mother would pretend to adjust her hearing aid and in a nice clear voice she'd say, what? I'm sorry, I had my hearing aid turned off. Oh, what you're asking is about what the decision is gonna be made on the new vendor who's gonna be dealing with the condo association? And my mother's voice can carry very, very well. And the person's going, shh, shh, shh. And my mother says, never tell me a secret. Never tell me a secret, right? So people can't manipulate her. I think the same thing is true with directors. And we're gonna talk a little bit actually in our next program on change about transparency. Transpa why we have sunshine laws. And that's why I want them to apply. It doesn't mean that everybody has to know everyone else's business, I'm not saying that. But if person A has a problem with person B, you bring them both in. Because it is very rare, it is one-sided. It is very rare that it's one-sided. Good point. Anyone else have something, a question or a comment about this little model so far? Do we have any, Joe? Um, and, the, and just give them to me one at a time. Yeah, uh, two. Uh, so the first is, what if an employee has a problem with their direct supervisor? How do you handle that without circumventing the system? Then you bring them both in. You bring them both in. and. Um, you have to have, remember, we have to have a system, a grievance process that allows people, and this goes back to cultivate safe environment, what if it's your immediate supervisor who's the problem? Or what if it's the supervisor above that supervisor who's the problem? All the people at the top of the food chain have to understand something, and administration and management, they are not exempt from the same rules that everybody else who works in the workplace. They are not magically exempt because they're a manager that they might not get called in. And sometimes you have to have a system, um, and we, I do this when I do board work, about when are the times, and they're rare, that an a employee is allowed to circumvent the grievance process um, and goes directly to the board about a director issue. And my rule of thumb, which has held up pretty well over the years, is if the director is committing a felony, you know, like they have their hand in the till, or they're breaking a really important supervisory rule like sexual harassment or something like that. But otherwise, we go through the process, and that's to hold everybody accountable. I do this because I've seen people's reputations and careers ruined by rumor and innuendo. And it's much better at the beginning to have everything set up. That's why I'm in favor of directors going through those 360 evaluation processes where, ev where you hire a firm to come in and there's an evaluation process so that you can find out what's going on and the firm looks at stuff and says this is what's um, happening. We have had some really ugly situations where direct supervisors were blatant in their sexual harassment or um, dealing with issues like racism and sexism and so on. Um, and the supervisor did it because they knew they would never be held accountable for what's going on. The thing that appalls me, folks, is when you hear these national stories about directors out of control for years spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you wonder, where the heck is the board? Now, one thing we do sometimes with boards, and I mention this because I know a lot of you work directly with your boards, is something we call a heads up. A heads up is kind of a gray area. So you're, um, say you're someone on a board and you're trying to pick the right melon and someone comes up and says, listen, I know it's none of my business, but I ran into a really bad situation at your library the other day with your director. And I witnessed the director being, doing things that I thought was inappropriate. Um, or 
I saw an employee, no, no supervisor around, I saw an employee doing something inappropriate. I don't know what to do. And the board member might say, let's do a heads up, thank you. And might call the director and say, I want to give you a heads up. I saw or heard this. There's no evidence you know, that would serve in a court, but this is what happened. Just thought you should have a heads up. But what I tell board members is that they should check with the director before to say whether or not the director would accept a heads up or if they would feel this was micromanagement. Um, and I would say three-fourths of the directors that we go through this process in a, an executive session meeting tell their board, yes, I do want heads up. But about a fourth of them say, no, I don't want a heads up because we have a lot of manipulative, crazy people in our town, and I don't want them to get in the habit of coming to board members with information. So you, you go by what the director says. What was the second one, Joe? Uh, the other question, what if one of the two, peop two people in the conflict doesn't want to sit with the other person to solve or talk about the problem? Well, it's um, insubordination if you ask an employee to come into a room and they won't come into a room. You can't have that game. I mean, really. We want you to come into a room and sit down. That should be part and parcel of what someone does for a living. You know, your boss asks you to come in. You're not, your boss isn't asking you to kill a kitten. They're saying, come into this room and sit down. If you really are so emotionally distraught that you can't do this, then the question is, does this person have the emotional maturity to work in that workplace? Because this is going to come up over and over again. Again, quoting my mother, one of the best pieces of advice she ever gave me is beware the tyranny of the weak. Beware the tyranny of the weak, which is saying beware the emotional blackmail of people who, oh, I'm so tender that I can't sit in a workplace and have a conversation with another person. And yes, sometimes people cry, so you bring Kleenex. And what I tell people, tears don't kill. So you have to be very calm about the person's crying. Okay, we cry. And um, that happens. But usually there comes a point where it may be above your level of expertise. You might need an expert. Um, I know people who I call on who are psychotherapists, who are licensed psychotherapists who specialize in business issues. Maybe that needs to be the situation. Um, and let me just say this before we, we close down for this break, and we'll come back and, and finish up everything. Um, I, had, uh, I was brought in because there was an employee at an academic library, and she was acting, quote, weird. That's what they told me, acting weird. And it was someone I had known for a long time. It was in Colorado. So I'm not a therapist or a counselor, so we sat down and I said, what the adult words going on? You're a great employee, people love you, you're a great tech services person. Person was in tears. She had just brought her mother home from the nursing home um, and her mother has um, Alzheimer's. And so she decided to take on the care of her mother with Alzheimer's. And even though she had people who were with her mother during the day, now every minute of her weekend and evenings was taken up with her mother. And she said, I'm not putting my mother in a home. And, I, and we talked about support networks, and we dragged out computers and looked at stuff. And basically, she was ashamed that she wasn't up to her usual impossible high standards of productivity because she was taking care of her mom. And I said, you're crazy. This is one of the most difficult things we all live through is dealing with family members who are sick or with dementia. Um, and your, your, your director adores you. This is, I'm going to tell you inappropriately, tell your director what's going on. And she did, and her director hugged, kissed, cried, said, oh, we've got all these resources in town, everyone's going to help, and everything like that. And I checked in a few weeks later, and things had changed. So we have to acknowledge there may be things going on in the person's personal life that really aren't in the art of our business, but on the other hand, it might not be a terrible thing that we're able to ethically and legally step in, but that's rare. Mostly, I find that people don't want to be held accountable. They just want to fire her, get rid of him. This person's no good. That's no good. We can't let them do it. And as painful as it is, it will be more painful if you don't do something. So let's take another break, folks, now for about six minutes. When we come back, we're almost done here, and we'll give you a couple exercises to do. OK? Thank you.
There we go. And again, I'm going to move back up to the slide we were just at. Supervising, catch the right, managing conflicts, intervention, OK? And um, I want to see, before we continue into the last part of the program, are there any questions or comments on any of the things that we've talked about so far? Anybody from the group here in Burr Ridge? If so, just raise your hand. Let me call on you. Can you come up? Question. Yeah, please. About supervisory actions that may be tempered sometimes with considerations for public relations issues. And we ask why, how many Illinois governors end up in prison? <laughs> you know, the, the um, polit I, I understand perfectly having, my, my dad actually was a county employee of the first mayor daily, so trust me, I understand <laughs> politics. Uh, but everybody has to decide when the line in the sand is. There's some things that are a little benign, but some things that are pretty serious. And this is where do you feel like you have a good network of people who have the same ethical standards that you do that you can talk to about issues like this? But generally, it would be something like um, where you're going to be considering action against an employee who is well-loved. No, oh, OK. The well-loved well employee. community employee that you know if you go too far, if you, mm -hmm. that you would get community Right. Severe backlash if you were to. Very good. Here's the issue, and it's again, it's a uh, community blackmail issue. Let's say, and, and I'm not saying this is the case here, but this is what I've run into. Um, uh, I'm going to be very blunt. Drunks are often very pleasant people. Alcoholics are often extremely pleasant people with great skills. So it is not uncommon to have someone in the workplace who's an alcoholic who's not doing their work but conning a lot of people and being really pleasant and fun, except the people in administration know the work isn't getting done. And they also know that this incredibly favorite person is there's going to be community backlash. In a smaller community or whatever, this is where you need that network support group of people who are going to back you up in terms of the law. Otherwise, you're basically saying, I'm going to make the right decision even though it might get me fired. And that happens sometimes. Um, so you go to the folks that you need to. Um, if you don't have the support of your board president to make that hard decision, that's when you start looking for another job. Because this starts corrupting your ability to be able to do your work if you have to be afraid of you make an honest, decent decision that's informed in your job as a director or a manager, and you're going to be thrown under the bus for doing it. You know, get out of Dodge before that happens. It might take two years. It might be difficult for your family, but you can't work in a place when you're afraid of making the right decision. Uh, so the issue, the um, example I want to use, which was very interesting, was in a Los Angeles suburb, and this is exactly what happened. The long-term drunk, high-functioning alcoholic uh, was losing it more and more, and they were costing the library a lot of money in their position. They wouldn't learn new things. It was a problem, all this stuff. And the director knew that it would be an issue. Also, the director herself didn't have the best interpersonal school skills. She, just, she was good. She wasn't a likable person in some ways. So she had a bunch of people out there who wanted her fired. So the first thing she did, because she was good at politics, is she went to the head of the board and sat down and talked through the whole issue. And the board guy said, you've got to be as absolutely honest with me as possible of everything you've done wrong, every flaw and everything. And they just laid it all out and everything. He said, no, I'll support you about this. And they figured out what to do and how to do it. And he went and talked to the board. And the board said, we will stand fast because our director is a good person and we know the situation, so we'll take the heat. Well, <laughs> everything blew up. And the person went to all his best friends and, and everything. So they did two things. They had a staff meeting that was a closed staff meeting under executive session, which was part of California's open meeting rules, where they could talk about what happened. And basically, she brought in a, um, a lawyer, personnel attorney, and um, an HR person who basically said, OK, folks, you're upset about the firing. Under California law, and it wasn't the director saying this, it was these experts. 
Your director is forbidden by law to say anything, just as she would have to protect your confidentiality if it was you. So what she's doing now is doing exactly what the law requires. Now, what questions do people have? And then they went through every possible question. And most of the staff, not all, went out and said, I didn't know that, okay, all right, you know. But they couldn't tell about the particulars. But then, this guy had a big friend at the city council. And the guy in the city council went to the papers, and then he went after the library board. Well, the gentleman who was head of the library board was a Chinese-American multizillionaire who had come over the country in a raft, one of those amazing success stories. I mean, he was like, I've dealt with the Chinese communists. I can deal with city council in Los Angeles. And he went up and made this incredibly articulate statement um, about the fact that the board was not going to back down and it wasn't at the city council's business and everything else. It took about six months to blow over. But she told me if she had, had not had the board support, um, not only would she not have fired the person, but she would have had to have quit because you can't let the bullies run the world. Even the nice bullies who think that you've done something bad. And many of these public battles are not bad people against good people, they're good people against good people. Mostly because the good people who are against the firing don't, and we'll never know the, the whole story about what's going on legally about stuff. And I'm not trying to be glib about this because I've had to face this myself, as have family members. And being a good supervisor sometimes means that you're always looking for your own, your, your next gig. You can't be complacent because that's when people say, okay, this is how I can blackmail you into never dealing with this situation. And it's benign, it's little, it's a library, but let's, let's, stop, let's stop the corruption there. Let's, let's stop it as well as we can. And I would never be upset with anyone who called me and said, I had to make the decision not to do the firing because I couldn't upset the mayor because it's the mayor's uncle's incompetent sister's brother's cousin's kid. It's like, you know, life is life. Life is life. Did anyone else have uh, one before we continue? These are good questions today. Did you have anything, Joe? I think, okay, very good. Okay, so this is the summary from the book, um, Supervision, I mean, uh, Discipline Without Punishment. And we've covered most of this about what it means to be accountable. And one of the things we had come up with before, I just want to say, is provide for grievances. As we've said, there should be an ability for people to know very clearly. And my, my standard is that once a year you have a meeting with all the employees and HR and everyone to go over what the rules are, um, what you can file a grievance about, what Illinois says, what the federal government says, you know, all the different categories of employees that are there, what you can complain about, what you can't complain about. So everyone has the same information. And I don't run those meetings in terms of the information, but I've been one of the facilitators that, you know, has called on people. And every time I've done this anywhere in the country, people are so grateful. They say, I didn't know. And it's not enough to give them the employee handbook. You really need a meeting with experts in the room who can talk through this stuff. Because people make up stuff. And the rules change. That's the other thing. The rules change. Stay accountable yourself. I'm a great Buffy fan, but I, I do like Supernatural better. But my bad, you know. That was one of the things we teach our staff right away. Everyone's held accountable. And my husband come, makes a point of coming out of his office and cheerfully telling the staff at lunch, well, I screwed up today, let me tell you how I screwed up. And this is how I'm gonna fix it. So there's no feeling that anyone is perfect. I have fired people who thought they were better than other people. And I fired an incredibly capable uh, gentleman this last year who was incredibly capable, but he was, a, he was an elitist in my opinion and a snob and he felt he was perfect and the rules applied to other people and he would not hold himself accountable for the mistakes he made. And you just can't have that. You just can't have that in an organization as well. We're gonna go over the micromanagement thing in the paper handout that we have. But one of the things I wanna emphasize on that is the fact that civility does count. We live uh, in central Denver near a great Mexican restaurant called El Ranchitos. And when we have uh, 
clients who want to work with my husband, private sector clients, we take them to that restaurant. And we had a man come into town, very wealthy, who wanted to hire my husband for some work. And my husband and the gentleman went to the restaurant. And the restaurant is a conduit for a family bringing their family in legally from, legally from Mexico. So the person waiting on you usually has been in the country three days and speaks no English. But you know, you point and smile and there's numbers and stuff, it works out fine. So my husband came back from lunch with the gentleman, the rich gentleman who wanted to hire him, and my husband said, we won't be working for your company. And the guy said, why not? And my husband said, because you were rude to the waiter. Character counts in our little business and how you treat everyday people every day is basically how you get through the bad times when you all hate each other's guts and just want to scream and throw computers against the wall, right? So we stay civil on things. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this resource list, which is in the, um, uh, the last slide here, next to the last slide. And it has the, dog, the books that we talked about here, the, particularly the Discipline Without Punishment book and the Don't Shoot the Dog book by Karen Pryor. Those are the two most important books on the list. They're easy reads. They have a lot of anecdotes and solid information. And I hope that you folks get them. And I'm going to just leave this up for right now. This is my contact information. And as I mentioned before, I do not charge for email or phone consultation. So we're just going to go to the list now. There was nothing that really popped up from your feedback that made me feel that we had to go into anything in depth. So I decided of all the stuff we talked about, there were a couple things that might be most useful. And what I would like to do is to have you take a look starting on page 9. And what we're going to do is take a look at the information that's on page 9, the management triangle, and then we're also going to take a look at the information on page 11, which is sometimes called the expectation model. This also will address the question of how do we tie strategic planning in with what we do every day as supervisors. So we need to be able to develop efficient ways to talk about what is the work that needs to get done and how we evaluate that work? What is the work that needs to get done and how we evaluate the work? So one of the first ways we do it is understanding the management triangle because it's sometimes called the iron triangle, by the way. It has many different names. It's been around forever. And some of you may have seen this. And I just want to make sure um, I'll talk to our extensive, vast technical staff. And I'm going to be standing over here next to the board and it's visible to the folks and very good. I just want to make sure that we have this here. And what I love about this is it's something you can teach a 12 year old. You know that any of the models I use can be taught to a bright high school student or a reasonably experienced high school student. They don't have to be uh, someone with a PhD or whatever. These are commonsensical things. Everything we do in life, according to this model, we're weighing three ideas. What is the quality of what we're doing? How good is it? How much does it cost in resources, particularly money? And how much time does it take? In effect, how convenient it is? And the model, which you, some of you I know have run into, is do you want it good? Do you want it cheap? Do you want it fast? Now, it's a ratio. There's some things in the world that we want really good. There's some things we want really cheap, some things really fast. So when I'm introducing these, this idea, for example, at a staff day, it's kind of fun because you can put anybody at anyone's table, mix people up, and then you get people to talk about this. So let's give a minute, and, and I hope the folks who are in the ether will join in with us. But what are the things in the world that you will spend a lot of money on and wait for because you want the highest possible quality. And if you have something in your life like that, raise your hand. And I can tell you what, what it is for me and my husband. But what's something in life that you want the highest quality that you will pay extra money for and you'll wait to get because quality is the most important thing? Anyone have an example? And raise your hand if you've got one. As an American consumer, we're not talking about the library, just as an American consumer. Yes, please. Um, I live in a house with all boys, and one of the things that I will spend more on is toilet paper when we go to the grocery 
I don't want the cheap toilet paper, I want the quality toilet paper. See, this is, I'm so glad you brought it up because this is an issue in our family. And this is the kind of thing people should go through marriage counseling before they move in with another human being. I am of the quality camp. I, well, actually I'm not, I, I, should, I should change that. My husband is of the quality camp. I am 64 years old and I am not adequately trained in my husband's mind to buy the right kind of toilet paper. He buys the most expensive quality paper, it must be the Vulcan quality paper that he gets. I'm the one who, I will buy what there's a coupon for on sale and or I'll buy what's on the first shelf coming in so I can grab it at the, and run back and get my work done. Um, divorces have happened over the toilet paper issue about things. I'm so glad you brought it up. So we can laugh about that, but isn't it true there's some people that quality is more important than money? So okay, this may be intrusive, but how many people here are like my husband and are of the quality camp? You'll pay extra for quality. How many people are like me who are the money camp you want to cheap? Right? We should really gone through marriage counseling before we figured out this issue. Anything else that you want really equality for? More so than money. Say again. The location of your retirement condo. So you're doing some research, right? And different places. So it's not that you're thinking, oh, I'm retired and I get to experience the joy of a northern Illinois winter for the rest of my life. Uh, no, no, I say, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and by the way, Denver's great because it's if you like the seasons, but we get sunshine. Right. That's I the big. Denver. Denver's good, except housing is like yes. out of the market yes. right now. It's amazing. I see people who spend more money, or more time trying to figure out what car they want than planning for their retirement. Isn't that interesting? how people do that. Now we have quality issues. One is that our cats aren't spoiled, but trust me, they eat the highest quality kitty food. And people tease us about it, but then they look at our cats and say, oh, your cats are gorgeous, they have such thick fur and they're so healthy and they're hardly ever at the doctor. And to me, the highest praise was when my vet said to me a few years ago, I wanna come back reincarnated as one of your cats. <laughs> so we don't, we don't skimp on the quality of our food for our pets because we've known it's paid off. And the same thing is we're not foodies, but we eat very high quality healthy food because as my husband says, it's cheaper than going to the doctor every other day and things like that. Um, I really am, I, I'm sorry, we're not into like wine and liquor, but definitely the imported single source fair trade Belgium dark chocolate from the Congo, I'm, yeah. We spent 50 cents more for something. I can't even believe I ate Nestle's when I was a child. It's just horrible. What else, be, okay, I want toilet paper cheap. What's something you want really cheap? Anyone have something, an example, that you want cheap, cheap, cheap? Yes, please. Gas. Gas, okay. All right, Americans will drive 30 minutes to save two cents a gallon on gas. We are not a rational species. Um, during one of the gas crises in recent years, somebody knocked over a gas station, stole a tanker full of gas, and they were selling it in their backyard for a dollar a gallon. The cop showed up at the cop with the TV cameras, and they were hysterical. I mean, everyone was laughing because they were saying to people, you're going up to these strangers with a um, milk carton, a, a gallon milk thing to fill it up with some unknown liquid that they're claiming is gasoline. And the people all said the same thing, but they're only charging a dollar. And they said, do you realize you could pour that into your car and ruin your car? The inside's forever, but it's only a dollar a gallon. I know, so people are really funny. Anything else you want really cheap? That you can think about. Those are the two that come up, you know paper goods, like paper towels and stuff, and um, uh, gasoline. Anything else you just want cheap? Okay, well here, what do you want fast? What does he want? Fast, 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 fast. Gas. What, you want, you want service fast, right? There's a lot of places we don't want to wait. We don't want to wait for fast food. I have blood sugar issues. If I'm at a restaurant and they're not serving me right away, my eyes pop out and start bleeding and, and my head whirls around and I spit out the pea soup and stuff. 
We wanted quick. My husband was uh, programming online services in the 1970s, and he was one of these people who would put in jokes and so on you know, so that people would have jokes. And the truth is that when we're under stress, we lose our ability to know how much time something is taking. So we think something has taken like a minute and it's really only taken like 10 seconds. That's just a really complicated thing. Well, the interesting thing is everything has a ratio. The hardest thing for people to talk about is quality. And this is where one of the fights comes in in departments and things in libraries is when you deal with issues where it's like, what is a quality experience? What is a quality experience at the front desk? What is a quality experience in terms of cataloging? What is a quality experience in terms of answering a reference question? What is a quality experience in terms of a, of a program for kids? All these things, what is quality? And I'm, the bad news is, if you have a totally healthy group of people who like and respect each other, Starting the conversation on what do we mean by quality can take three to six months minimum. And part of the reason is that each of these ways of seeing the world has a blind spot, let's call it. There are people who think that quality is the only bottom line. And we call those people perfectionists. That's the definition of a perfectionist. A perfectionist is a person who doesn't understand the time-space continuum or budgets. And with all due respect, even with the great archival collections that I've had the pleasure to visit, like Texas Tech University, where they are richer than God and built an archival library that is to die for, or the Morgan in New York and so on, or the Newberry in Chicago. There's places that are these high-level research archival libraries that are well endowed. The Harvard libraries, which, you know, best endowed university on the planet. But nonetheless, there still is time and money considerations, resources, and so on. So how many people here have ever worked using this definition of work for a perfectionist? who just really didn't understand the, how much they were costing. Being a perfectionist in most libraries is as profligate as standing in your parking lot ripping up $100 bills. And which is why very little is done in our office without see what you can do in an hour and then stop. You know, and I had two perfectionists working for me and I didn't cure them, but it got much better working for them because they knew whenever they had a project, they said, how long do you want me to spend on this? I said, see what you can get done in two hours. Because I'm always thinking about the hourly wage and salary as both uh, a money issue and a time issue. How much is this costing us? You know, in fact, one time, I have to say, I lost my temper with someone. I said, you're gonna bankrupt me. You're doing beautiful work, but you're taking like five times more longer than we have planned, and that's stealing your time and money from other projects that we should be doing on stuff. I've had people tell me that drawing out the triangle and writing the word perfectionist out has helped some perfectionists understand the impact of what they're doing. And I have had the perfectionist say, and I, I will exaggerate the voice, well, I expect that you want me to lower my standards. Okay, first of all, try not to smile when they say that. I mean, I sometimes have to excuse myself and splash cold water and laugh hysterically and then come back. And I say, what I want you to do is to change your standards because we did not marry for money. And we have this bottom line and we have this bottom line. And you're costing us four times as much as we budgeted for. And if you can't work within the constraints, you're gonna to have to go find that workplace where the boss married for money and you can throw as much money as you want for that. And that was something a lot of people didn't think about for a long time. Now, on the other hand, if all they care about is the money issue, we call this a false economy. And this is the person who only cares about saving money. So guess what? They spend five hours going through a catalog to, sp to save 10 cents on reams of paper. I mean, I've seen people do that, right? Or they have what we used to call, they're dying off now, the depression era mentality. And it's really hard, and, I, and I, I see this with my mom, and it breaks my heart, because she saved money to the point that saving money was the goal rather than having money to spend. Money's a tool, it's a tool. So 
And I also want to apologize as an evil private, evil private sector person for all the clueless failed private sector people who start working in public and nonprofits and start talking about the bottom line. And they'll say things like, well, in business, money's the bottom line. Excuse me, no it isn't. We have three bottom lines. Uh, no one's gonna tell me that Steve Jobs, rest his soul, only cared about money. You know, he cared about driving his staff crazy, getting the white, the right colored white for the iPod, right? That was part of it. It was also quality issues. So I work a lot with board members who are too ancient to be on a library board. I'm sorry I said that out loud. Um, because all they care about is what they think is the bottom line about things. And we have to back them off and talk about issues like quality. This one's an interesting one. What about the people obsessed with time? We call this false productivity. False productivity is doing things really, really, really fast. And this is something Toby and I are working on. He's a great guy and he's really fast. And guess what? He has to redo what he does two or three times sometimes. He's learning to slow down. He's really, he's great. He's great. Um, and it's that thing of where don't you want people rushing through doing stuff? Where do you want them to pause? What is having to be careful? So we don't think about it much, folks. We're all working adults here. But it's interesting, when we come into new areas, we have to reset this ratio between the quality of what we're doing, how much money and time we're taking in terms of outlay, and literally how much time it's taking us or the customer to be able to do things. And so very often between a supervisor and an employee or among members of a team, if you haven't had these conversations in the beginning, that's where you butt heads. Where you told me to do a good job. Those are meaningless code words. I thought you, you're supposed to do a better job. I told you I wanted good customer service and you're not giving me. Do you have any clue about what I'm talking about? Of course not. Of course not. So this is why, particularly on big projects, this is something where people like me get called in because people are arguing about things that should have been settled at the beginning of the project. What do we mean by quality? And isn't it true it's usually one or two people who has a different view than everybody else, right? Like most of the team can be, okay, we're kind of on the same page, and then there'll be the person who's the perfectionist or the false economy person who's spending time saving pennies. So once you get this ratio together, and let's take a look, please, on um, the, the next sort of set of pages. If you could take a look on page 11, and you're looking for this little graphic, and I'm going to write out this graphic so that you can see it here on the board. And this is from project management, and I have to say this is one of the most important things that I learned um, having to do with productivity and project management. And it's called the expectation models. And again, it comes from the project management world. So this can apply to what an individual does. It can apply to a department, a special project. It also can apply to giving you a um, picture, a graphic of the entire strategic plan in very simple terms. So the question is, how can we have oversight without micromanagement? So the first step is we want to decide what are the three goals that we want the person, the department, the project to accomplish. These goals are accomplishments like, and, they're, and different authors use different words. What are the results that we want to get from doing whatever it is we're doing? What is it that we want to accomplish? What are the benchmarks that we want to reach? So an example would be, why are we shoveling the walk? A job description might say, we're shoveling the walk to obey city law, to keep it safe um, for our neighbors, and um, to make our house look pretty. But a result might be, 
we're shoveling the walk so that we are being good neighbors and that the people in our neighborhood feel good about us because we're living up to our obligation as good neighbors. And to live up to our obligation of good neighbors, some of the things we do include um, making sure the walk is shoveled within you know, 24 hours of the last snowfall, making sure that we're not just shoveling the walk, but we're salting the walk, even though salting is not required by the law, making sure that we go out at night um, when the temperature is dropped and make sure there's no black ice. Uh, and we live on a, on a corner, so there's you know, a lot to be able to shovel. So this is not the job description. This is what, if we're doing our job well, will result as it. And here's the interesting thing. You can't have more than three or five of these, and they have to be prioritized. One, two, three. So what's the most important thing? Well, for us, even more important than the legality is the safety issue. That the main reason we would want to do this is because we want to be part of creating a safe environment. And we're aware, for example, we live two blocks from an old parish church in central Denver, and we have the folks going to mass every morning. And I'm very pleased, I'm probably when I go home, this will not be true, but we've lived in this house for 30 years and we've never had anyone slip and fall after a storm that we know of. Or at least not badly enough that they came to the door to yell at us or threaten us or something like that. So we've tried real hard. This really starts getting you to really think, why are we doing the things we're doing? It causes us at every level to justify what we're doing, which is a good thing. Not just to go through the motions, not just to say this is the way we've already always done it, but how is what we're doing contributing to that big strategic plan? And this is where we often start winnowing out stuff that we've been doing by rote for years that are no longer necessary for the success of the library and our interaction with our patrons as well. So this is, we'll call these goals for right now. I don't care if you call them bananas. Every, everybody does a different one. So we'll call these, we'll make it three goals. And what this becomes, ladies and gentlemen, is the destination. What is it that we're actually trying to accomplish? And usually the destination is from the point of view of the library user, not from the library staff. Is what we're doing making a difference in the lives of the people we serve? Because if it isn't, then it may be an operation issue, but it certainly isn't a strategic issue. Uh, I think, for example, um, and here's, here's one example where a library is really concerned about having a great reference collection. That's great, but what does great reference collection mean, and what does it mean for a community? If you change a goal from, we want to have a great reference collection, to we want to be part of ensuring everybody who, who lives in our town has a good job, that really changes the focus of what you're doing with the reference collection, doesn't it? If it's rather than library oriented versus what do the people who live and work and use your library need in their lives. And then you make a whole bunch of different decisions based on we want people to have great jobs. We want to help start more businesses. We want kids to, um, here's a great goal, we want everyone who graduates from high school in our community to be able to choose any kind of secondary education they want, whether it's college or trade school or whatever, and to get into one of their first top three choices, which is a very different statement than we want to have a professional library collection. And most people settle with we want a, prof a professional library collection. So this is the real, I think of these as the real goals, the real world things of if we do our job great, this is the results that we're going to get on behalf of the people we serve. Some people don't like this, by the way. And, and by the way, I'm working with the um, uh, library in the Midwest in Nebraska and been looking over the new strategic, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the new strategic um, standards, uh, planning standards they're putting in from the Nebraska Library Commission. And they're all written to be customer-centered rather than library-centered. It's not how great we're doing, it's how great the communities and institutions we serve are doing. And then this is the heart of it.
that these are the professional standards and technical standards, and this is the other one, which we'll come to in a minute. So the question is, we want to accomplish these things, but there are parameters, there are constraints, there are guides about what we can and can't do. We have to color within the lines. Well, first of all, we have to accomplish this by an agreed upon level of quality, which can be a conversation, right? We are going to accomplish this in a certain amount of time. We are gonna accomplish this within a certain framework of budget. We are gonna do things ethically and legally. So we're gonna do some stuff and we're not gonna take shortcuts that um, cut our ethical standards or our legal standards. So these are the things we need to do here and civility. We will be polite and respectful to each other while we do it. How many people have ever worked with someone who, because they were so smart and or they had such terrific professional or technical skills, they thought that they didn't have to be polite? Has anyone besides me ever worked with that person? Probably in Indiana or someplace like that, I don't know. <laughs> Just someplace else. I find this, and I, and I hate to be stereotypical, I sometimes find this with really, really start, smart people, sometimes in academic or in special libraries, where it's basically, I'm so smart, I can be a jerk. You know, Now, those are less tolerated in the world. We don't have time for jerks because everybody else has to walk on eggshells around them. It lowers everybody else's predict productivity. And people say, what about Apple computers? Well, Apple, as much as I love them, charged unconscionably high margins for years. And people said, you know, I didn't mind being fired by Steve Jobs 10 times every day because he was paying me a quarter of a million dollars a year, plus I had all this Apple stock. And I was a millionaire by the time I was 25. I bet that's not the situation in your libraries, guys. <laughs> You're not paying people to accept abuse. So please don't use those private sector examples when we're talking about um, small public sector agencies. So here's the exciting part. Let me get a different colored pen. If I know the goals that I'm supposed to achieve, the results I'm supposed to get, if I know what the professional and technical constraints are, and I know how to be civil, how I do my job is up to me, and this is called style. If I know, if I work for you, and I know what, I'm what results I'm supposed to get, so if I know, for example, in customer service that one result that I get is that if somebody was interviewed leaving the library, they would say, I was treated well, and my um, question was answered, and I feel like not only can I come back again, but I would recommend the library to other people. That's what we want. Cool. I achieved my goal. This is great. If we have professional standards that say things like, if the weight aligned in the, um, at the reference desk is more than 10 minutes, then we give people a coupon for a free ice cream cone because it's July in Illinois, and um, give them a phone number that they can call back or ask them to come back or something, but people don't have to wait. And our definition of quality is that people for serious reference questions get at least three to five resources. At least one of them's a book, and at least one of them is online. That's our standards about things. Um, and that we make sure that we're not filtering what people get um, through our own biases and such. But on the other hand, maybe we have some laws having to do with access to certain sites with minors and we obey those laws even if we don't agree with them and go through that. And I did that and I was polite and friendly with the teenage boys. But this is my style and how I get it done. And this is where you talk about different management styles and so on. If people can accomplish the goals within the constraints. Now, sometimes there is a consistency issue so that people don't have to relearn all of the rules regarding circulation every shift because every shift has a different way to do it. And that's, that's a quality issue that's reasonable. But this is one of the more important models for supervisors to think about because it's a way of communicating in a simple graphic 
Are you achieving the goals within the constraints? And here's the neat thing, and let me, let me pull out a red pen for that. Then what you're going to be evaluating is, are they reaching the goals? Are they doing it within the constraints? And this here, think of it as an arch, this is oversight. Coming to an agreement about the goal, reaching the goals within the constraints, rather than micromanaging someone about how they do something. And let me say one last thing, and then we're going to ask some questions and start um, answering some questions and start closing up for the day. Somebody might come up with a way of doing something, and you disagree with it strongly. But you know what? It doesn't violate the constraints. Just a different method of doing things. And you know what? Nine times out of ten, they'll probably be successful doing it a different way from you. But if they aren't able to achieve it the way you want, you have permission to say, you're not achieving the goals within the constraints doing it the way you've chosen. I'm going to suggest a different way. That's not micromanagement for you to say, we tried it your way. It's not working according to this. Let's try a different way of doing it. And I've had people come to me a lot in recent years because they know about this model. And they say, well, um, I don't know if I'm micromanaging or not. And I say, OK, let's write it out. What are the expectations in terms of the results people are supposed to get? And what people will do sometimes is they'll make these the goals. These are not goals. Finishing something on time is not a goal. That's, that's not a goal. Um, so you say, no, no, no. You can, that's, you know, finishing something under budget, that's not a goal. That's what operations does. What actually do you want people to accomplish? So I had a library director in northern Wisconsin a few years ago. We're going through this model. And she said, well, I have a problem employee who says I'm micromanaging. And I said, what's the problem? And she said, well, she takes her own sweet time shelving. And I told her she should do it more efficiently, and she ignores me. And I said, well, OK, let's examine this. Is, can people find material in a timely fashion? She said, yes. I said, is she reasonably accurate? Yes. I said, great, so she's getting stuff where it's supposed to be so people can find stuff, and she's doing it accurately, right? So we're supporting the whole access service model of access to information. Great. Does she damage the books while she's doing it? Does she sort of like place kit, kick books and scuffle them on the floor? She says, no, she doesn't damage books. They thought it was funny. And I said, how does she treat her coworkers? She's nice. I said, when she's done with her shelving, does she work at CERC? Does she do tech services? Yes. Is she nice? Yes. Is she nice to the customers? Yes, she's nice to everybody. And I said, I don't know how to tell you this, but she's fulfilling the goals within the constraints. And how she does it is up to her. I said, but what I'm suspecting is you're not giving her enough work to do. Maybe she's doing it a little too leisurely, right, if that's what the issue is. So it's very interesting, I think. And by the way, there's something about putting it on a board and having a group of people who talk about it, talk about what's here in the model, that tends to lower emotionality about things. So we gave you today a whole bunch of stuff from behavioral science, from supervision, personnel management, and so on. Um, the rest of the information in the handout, we've tried to arrange in such a way that you could use it for the particular issues. If you look at page 18, we have even some more resources. Some of these are the same ones that are in your slide, but there are even more there. So let me pause, see if there's any questions, and then I'm going to do a little exercise with you, and we will be finished. So out of all the things that we talked a little bit about today, did anyone have any questions or comments? And we'll start first with the folks here in, in Burr Ridge. Did anyone have a question or comment about anything that we, we talked about today? Or a concern? How about the people in the ether, Joe? Do we have anyone? Well, I just put a call for last questions. Nothing okay, yet, great. but I did, you should know that Kim said, bless you. Oh, OK. Thank you. <laughs> Gesundheit, right? <laughs> Very good. 
Well, let's do this while we see if anyone has any questions. If you were teaching a class on supervision, what from today's program would you want to include in your own curriculum? If you were teaching a class on supervision, what from today's program would you want to include in the curriculum? Yes, sir. Holding people accountable. Yeah. And I hope that I gave you some ideas for folks that it's not about being mean. It's not like you're a meanie doing this. It's just that you are fulfilling your contract. And remember, you all have social contracts as stewards of government resources with your taxpayers. And that includes how much time it takes to do stuff. So, excellent. Yes, please. Let, let me start with this lady then here. Go ahead, please. Positive yeah. Is not, to, no matter how you were raised, right, no matter how you were raised, still learning how to apply good positive reinforcement. Someone told me something once that changed my attitude about being a supervisor. They said, you're like a battery. It's like you're like a battery with energy and you don't want to be perky, but if, a, if a, somebody's having a difficult day at work, you're the person who best suited to turn them around, you know, to give them that extra little boost. And you know what, when you get to do it well, it's really fun. I travel for a living. Oftentimes I'm in airports and places where everything's going wrong. And I'm usually the person who can go up to the front counter and make that person feel good and then watch them treat everybody who comes after me differently. I would like you to use your newfound power for good, okay, in terms of positive reinforcement. And what did you have? Oh, the agreement Actually, elements, yes. Actually, taking a job, coming to an agreement. Yes. And when you have the different elements of agreement, remember part of your job as a supervisor or manager is you get to be Solomon. You get to cut the baby in half. Uh, if there are two groups of people who are very close to agreement or you know, you've been arguing for six months what the ILS is, well guess what, it's probably it doesn't matter which one you choose because the cost benefit ratio is pretty much the same. So one of the things that I tell my employees is, I help you get back to work. So when you feel stuck, you're stuck on a decision or you're stuck on what to do next or you're stuck should it be red or blue, I'll come to me and I'll use my sword or flip a coin and literally we'll flip a coin and go blue, go back to work. And that's, that's part of your job as a supervisor and in increasing productivity. <coughs> so, and in a lot of workplaces we work with, we set a deadline. Like we will take until Friday to discuss this. And if a clear choice does not come up by Friday, we'll make a few phone calls and see if any of our friends are saying, no, no, that vendor's terrible. They're under indictment in Indiana. No, no. Um, then we're gonna flip a coin and make a choice. Anyone else here have something you would include in your own curriculum from this morning? Please. You have to share your expectations if you want them to be accountable. Yeah. You have to do the expectations. And I would honestly say that that becomes my first question in most experiences of working with people. And a piece of paper or a manual is not enough. It's not enough to say to people, go look at the website. It's got the personnel manual. Or here's a copy of our strategic plan. No, you really actually have to have a conversation. Because English, if you haven't noticed, is a very slippery language. And there's three things I know that I've learned over the years. Very smart, well-intended human beings can disagree, misunderstand, and make mistakes. And so if the way we're, this comes back to your communication issue, if the way we're communicating isn't working, then we have to do something different. Most uh, behavior problems in workplaces are symptoms of something else that we're not doing. So it's not like, okay, what do I need to be doing differently to deal with this situation? Very good. Anyone else? Please. How to, how to do a conflict intervention. Oh, the conflict. I think a lot of supervisors and new supervisors don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult for them to do that. And so they have to talk to their employees or their staff supervisor about issues. And some of the steps 
in that are the same steps, even if it wasn't a conflict between two staff members, if it's just a problem mm -hmm. that the supervisor is having with the performance of a person. Mm -hmm. Some of those same steps is what you would use when you're having a Very good. Uh, session with them. Excellent, excellent. I think we're almost out of town time, Joe. Is that right? Are we done? Yeah, we are. Um, I'll just say the other ones, uh, maturity level came in from the internet as far as for your list. Um, Excellent. But yes, we are, um, we are out of time here, but certainly hope that some of you can stick around for our 1.30 uh, workshop, uh, those of you online as well, and help me thank uh, Pat for coming here today thank and you. talking to us. Thank you very much. And um, thank you, thank you. Um, and I left some cards over there. Of, they're the ones with the pretty uh, astronomical photo on them, but they also have a free code for one of our webinars. So you can use that free code for one of our essential webinars. So pick up a card if you like. And anyone here in Burr Ridge wants to share a card with me, that would be great. Thank you.